Sister, you said the Quran says that a person was born as a Muslim and he changes his religion, he's put to death. Sister, I don't know of any verse in the Quran. He took, he raided a Jewish tribe. The king of peace, he, he's trying to make peace in the community. He didn't come. If he was really coming and he wanted to get rid of the Jews, he had the power and the will to do that. This is the Shahada. She yes. came out. Muhammad said, anybody who changes his religion, kill him. And Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. He's not aware of this story being fabricated. He didn't stone the lady who committed adultery. He is without sins, let him cast the first stone. That that was not in the original. I think uh, there should be an investigation to find his family, to find his father. I second that. Now a devout Christian convert warning the world, Islam is out to destroy you. That's how you recite the Quran. I know the Quran inside out. And I'll tell you what, I'm really excited. The Dean Center is becoming a reality. Allahu Akbar, pulling the resources together, making this dream a reality. A mega dawah center in the United States. Allahu Akbar, this is the future and it's happening. We've got the location, but now we gotta get the work going. We gotta build the masjid. We gotta build the dawah center. We need you to donate now, not for me, not for Eddie, but for that masjid, for that house of Allah that Allah would be worshiped in. We need to build that dawah center where people can come from across the world and come and get trained in how to give da'wah and non-muslims can come and learn about islam we got to get this done everybody donate let's do this together it's happening allahu akbar there is none greater than the Assalamu alaikum, greetings and peace. Welcome to the Dean Shah Media host. Hit that notification bell, subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss exciting programs like this with my exciting next guest. You guys all, probably by now, most of you, if you haven't already, have heard about the conversation of the year that happened where we got on a platform where we were talking. Unfortunately, it was with career Islamophobes and they had a lot to say. They did the machine gun method. So now to address some of these things that some people still might have some questions about, I have an Imam Yusuf Susui. He has memorized the entire Quran. It's one of the miracles of the Quran that is memorized by millions living today from the past, present, and will continue memorizing in the future. And has also a bachelor's degree in Islamic sciences amongst other specialities. And this is one of them. So we're going to go ahead and address many of these. We're going to dissect it. Go look at the round table religious discussion and we're going to go ahead and break some of these things down don't go anywhere we have one god his name's Allah, Allah. And his final messenger is Muhammad Peace be upon him This is our religion, Islam, Islam This is the Deen Show Do I love you, man, I'll work that you're doing When I was ready to talk about it, I would only talk to you yes. I was explaining how much respect I have for the faith the of Islam show. Welcome to the Deen Show The Deen Show Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh hayyakum Allah How you doing my brother? Allahumma lak alhamd It's very good to be back on your show after a few months Allahumma lak alhamd Yourself? Na, na, alhamdulillah Nice to have you back here with us You got a chance to uh, see this uh, round table discussion? Yes, yes Very uh, informational Very uh, entertaining and mm -hmm. educational I should say mm -hmm. um, And a lot a lot to take away from, from that And uh, yeah Yeah uh, uh, Daniel and uh, Jake did a really great job. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, yes. We were yes. down there together. And there's a lot to unpackage. You, you saw this and you, um, there were some things that now, you know, w what are your thoughts at the end of the day, like overall, overall with the discussion, how it went? I, w I would have liked to have seen people, you know, who aren't in, in it for the money, a career, uh, as we call them, Islamophobes, haters, people who, at the end of the day, they're not going to really shift their position. You know, it's like if someone's praying wrong or someone is like, what I mean by is if there's a, a f there's something that you're doing wrong in Islam, right? And someone comes to you and says, you know, you're not actually supposed to do it like this. And the person's never going to change. That's how these person, you know, 
you, you bring them color, uh, scholarly consensus, the right way to interpret the Quran, right. the right way to go ahead and, you know, you bring them all the scholarly reference. They're just like, no, they're just going to keep repeating the same thing because they've been, there's many situations where they've been explaining, no, it's like, it's supposed to be like this. Uh, just like I, uh, you know, the the the, um, the verse of the sword, um, where Jesus talks about, I have not been sent uh, to bring spread peace, but a sword. But when a Christian explains it to you, that's uh, you know how it's actually supposed to be in context. Mm -hmm. we, we don't insist. No, no, it means like this. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, what are your thoughts that, on that? Where do I start? Okay. Um, First, I would like to say that the likes of Robert Spencer, uh, David Wood, and this uh, th this other individual with them, uh, Rashid Hamami, um, there are many out there in in, in, in the non-Muslim world, especially in the West, uh, UK, non-Muslim countries, UK, Australia, uh, America. There are many people who are out there, provocateurs, as you said last time, uh, people who are spewing venom out there to very good, well-intentioned People who are really seeking the truth. They don't have any anima animosity towards Muslims. They don't have any kind of hostility. However, after listening to some of the venom that's being spewed by this person and his ilk, uh, you really you're really not left with an option. One, one example that I think is, is vivid to bring up here is that you'll have many who will say, oh, I was this devout Muslim. I was raised just very similar to the story of Rashid Hamami, where he will say, I was raised in a very strict family. We were reading Quran. We were studying this. We were up all night. In other words, hey, I'm coming with a lot of credibility under my belt. One that comes to mind is Sam Solomon. Uh, I've done a video rebut rebutting him years mm -hmm. ago. This man comes to a stage. He comes to rural America, rural Minnesota, to, to, to people who really don't know much about Muslims, right? And he tells them something as simple as reading Surat Az Zulzula. Mm -hmm. First off, it's Surat Az Zalzala. And then he goes on to say, Inna So he starts with the, the name of the chapter, and then he says the chapter wrong. That's like me. And this person basically is telling his audience that he taught Islam for 15 Dec for 15 years. In other words, this is not an average Muslim. But come to find out, he has his ABCs of Islam completely screwed up. He cannot pronounce the Quran correctly, but you ha know nothing about Islam. You're not going to know what's false. You're not going to know what's true. You have nothing to counter that with. So you're just going to assume that this person is looking out for our best interest. But these people are only and simply driven and motivated by the monetary sum that comes out of this. It's not about being good-hearted, looking out for the well-being of others. It's simply based in money. This is all a lot of these people are after. And you you mentioned this uh, Sam individual. You also have this uh, Walid Shuhubat. You know, heard of him. Yeah, what uh, another clown. Yeah, he yeah. was he a was, uh, supposed uh, guy who was out there, former Muslim. He accepted, uh, he became a Christian, and he's on the, the Islamophobia circuit. Right. And he's out there. He was discredited. Uh, they did a report, CNN. They went back and they saw that he's a liar. Once a Jew-hating, bomb-throwing terrorist, now a devout Christian convert, warning the world, Islam is out to destroy you. <laughs> That's how you recite the Qur'an. I know the Qur'an inside out. His message before a largely positive crowd of cops and emergency responders at this South Dakota Homeland Security Conference, trust no Muslim, especially those who organize. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. All Islamist organizations in America should be the number one enemy. All of them, the Islamist organization, the Islamic Society of North America should be focused on. You got that on camera? Yes, please. He is being paid $5,000 plus expenses to yeah. speak here with your That's tax dollars. Being a terrorism expert has become a cottage industry since 9-11. The Department of Homeland Security has spent nearly $40 million on counterterrorism training just since 2006. An ex-terrorist, it's Walid Shabbat's claim to fame a terrorist, a PLO member, who bombed a branch of an Israeli bank in Bethlehem Square, throwing a firebomb on the bank's roof. The problem with the story, with a lot of Shubat's stories, there's no evidence for them. And despite CNN's many requests, neither Shubat nor his business partner have provided us with any. 
bombings in Bethlehem Square, you specifically said you threw... The bank was in, 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 in the Bethlehem Square. You threw explosives. Yes, I did. On top of that bank. Yes, I did. No record. CNN's Jerusalem Bureau went to great lengths trying to verify Shubat's story. Finding the general location where the branch of Bank Lumi once stood, but not finding anyone who could remember a bombing. We contacted the bank headquarters in Tel Aviv, asking officials to search records. No records found. And Israeli police found no record anyone ever threw a bomb at the branch of the bank. Why would the bank not have a record? Why would the, the Israeli police not have a record? Why would the Israeli police not have a record? I don't know. I mean, I don't know where you check, what dates, all these things. There's another part of his story that doesn't check out. Shubat says he was arrested and spent two weeks in an Israeli prison. There's no record of you being in prison. I think there'd be at least an arrest record. They held you for two weeks. Wouldn't would the they, United States know you, you were in prison you, if you were you a US citizen? Well, how about me and you go to the Muscovia prison and extract the records? The records are there. Okay. Well, would you well, be willing to do so? We did. And the Israeli detention center could find no record of detaining anyone with the name Walid Shabbat. He's just a liar. He's just, this is big business. This is money for him. Th there's a lot of money. There's a lot of money to be made. And, and let me just make for the record. Christians are seeing this, though. It's smart. I mean, you can, uh, you know, good Americans out there who just, you know, they're um, taken away, you know, by much of this propaganda and the fear machine, the hate machine. But there's, I think they're starting to wake up slowly to these uh, profiteurs of the hate. And, and as, you, as you said, there are a lot of good, well-intentioned people out there. But unfortunately, they're getting their news from the wrong avenues. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this is what we have displayed in front of them, our, our people like yeah. this. What else, before we get into it, what else uh, do you want to comment before? Because we got uh, quite a few here. We're going to go through the PD, PBD podcast, Patrick McDavid podcast. We're going to break down uh, some of these things that they had spoken about. And there was a lot of things. In, right, in, right. Um, so some things, uh, and it's very difficult, you know, at that time, Daniel and them, they're getting all these things so you can't address every single thing, right, at, at the moment. And that's their, that's what they, their tactic was, just to throw that machine gun method, just throw a bunch of stuff out there yep. and go ahead and see, like, how you're going to handle it in and, it, and, and short, this short amount of time. It's definitely a scare tactic, for sure. Yeah. It's a scare tactic, and I think they're appealing to people's emotions. They're They're, they're dealing with people who are... Uh, quite frankly, not, not, I don't want to say naive, but they're ignorant of what Islam is and what Islam isn't. And I think all, oftentimes people's minds are changed when they end up meeting Muslims firsthand. Oh, I didn't know you guys were like this. You guys are normal people. You send your kids to school too. You guys go to parks. You pay your taxes too, right? So they don't realize this until they end up having a Muslim neighbor or a Muslim friend, colleague, or someone that they work with, right? One takeaway that I think that's very, very, very profound that I find personally is looking at the reaction from Patrick when he's speaking and dealing with someone such as Daniel Haqiqachu, yeah. right? Is that... Muslims, I think this message is for us Muslims, is that we have to come to terms with the obvious fact and the obvious reality that Islam is unique. Islam is different than every other religion out there. I think what Muslims, especially who are part of these big organizations, what they're what they're priding themselves on is unfortunately trying to show the Western world how, hey, we're, we're all, we're no different. We're just like you guys. The problem with this method though, is that when your product looks like every other product out on the market, what makes you stand out? What's going to make that person walking down the aisle and say, well, what is this? If your product looks like every other product on the shelf, and it doesn't look different, it doesn't stand out. Where in the world is the incentive for someone to stop do the research and say, I really want to know more about this. Because some of us are completely bent on the idea of, hey, we're no different than you guys. We, I think it's about time, right? I think the time is now for us Muslims to stand up tall and proud and to say, no, we're not like you guys. Now, this is not a message of hostility. We can still have community cohesion. We can still, have, we can still coexist. The, the, one does not negate the other. I think a lot of people, and again, this stems from a deep self-inferiority complex, is that some of us Muslims are truly afraid just to express that we don't do this in Islam. 
There's no such thing in Islam. What we're doing is we want to take every non-Muslim concept, every cultural concept that's out there, and we want to appeal to a verse from the Quran, a hadith from the Sunnah, or a story of the Sahaba, and say, ha, see, we have a Muslim way of doing it. So sometimes we want to just Islamify every concept. We have to come to the reality and to the ter- with the obvious fact that some things cannot be Islamified irrespective of how you slice and dice it. I think this is better for us Muslims moving forward instead of having to cherry pick and to show them that, hey, are you convinced now? Maybe some, maybe it's not that time to convince the person, right? Uh, some people will get this somewhat. I just, my mind started thinking uh, when you said that, I mean, you can start from the basic things like uh, going to the bathroom, right? Uh, no, we're not like that, like you in a sense that we prefer water over toilet paper, but we can do both, right? Washing. So the minute, uh, one of the smallest things, we have direction in life, purity in Islam, how it's so, so important. So uh, another thing is uh, uh, we're not like you. Or we don't have to go to the party and drink alcohol. Um, we don't have for, to intermingle. That's okay. So, There's no such thing as... We have set, set boundaries. Uh, another thing is uh, we don't have girlfriends. We marry Yeah, there's no women. such thing as an Islamic boyfriend or boyfriend. an Islamic yeah, girlfriend. So, uh, in worship. We don't worship creation. We worship the one creator. Right. Right. So these right. are the things. But people respect that so much. And people actually, when they look into Islam, they're like, I want some of that. Because it's, it, it's the, the complete wholesome way of life. It's beautiful. But again, I, I think the question, the million dollar question is this. What's the incentive if I'm sitting here trying mm-hmm. to show you that, hey, I'm a carbon copy of you. Where is the incentive for that person now to be on your side? If you're just telling them, hey, you and I are just identical, we're alike, we're twins. Where is the incentive for that person now to make that leap from that side of the fence yeah. onto this side of Apple's the fence? Apple's unique in some itself. It has a unique, Apple product is an Apple product. And that's why people like Apple, right? Because it has. So you're saying like that? Islam is unique in its own special. Very, and we have to be proud of that. We have to stop trying to convince others that, uh, no, we have a Muslim way of doing it. Sometimes there's no, there's no Muslim way of doing it. It's not Islamic at all. Gotcha. All right. So we uh, should we get into it? Okay. Let's go ahead and start. Probably the main thing is the sanctification of violence and the idea that God will bless and even calls upon the believers to commit acts of violence under certain circumstances. Like Rashid here is an ex-Muslim, and so under Islamic law, as it's traditionally and classically formulated, he would be put to death. Uh, Muhammad said, anybody who changes his religion, kill him. And this is how they, they pretty much started off. Uh, Patrick asked him, so what do you got against Islam? And he went specifically for what we call the penal code. And if I'm not mistaken, the penal code makes up uh, two, three percent of... Uh, give or take. Of, Isla- give of or the take whole of message the whole- of Islam. Yeah. Yes. So what are your thoughts now? Yeah. yeah it, it, it's funny, but but that's and not... They did, they did a brilliant job, Daniel Jake. They took it back to, you know, them actually following liberal secular, secularism, not Christianity, because the, the same thing, you know, you have many of the injunctions, they're there in your in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, one th- there, There's a lot to unpack when it comes yeah. to this. First, it's not out of thin air. Mm-hmm. It's not spontaneously done. In other words, for someone like Robert Spencer to come with the first thing to bring out and to mention the concept of violence in Islam uh, or the concept or the idea or the had of the, the apostasy law, it's, it's not out of thin air and it's not done spontaneously. That is, that is intentional and that is, again, he's playing on the emotions of the, the, the well-intentioned uh, viewer. First off, when we talk about that, he gives the impression that it is our job as Muslims that if we hear about someone leaving Islam, that it is our duty to meet up and go looking for this person. That is not our job. So misconception number one is that we as Muslims, there is no such thing as being a vigilante, in, especially in this case, meaning that if someone leaves Islam, it's not your job, it's not my job. This is the job of the Muslim government. There's a tribunal, there's a court, there's a judge. And again, the ulama, as, as the Prophet ﷺ, he says, الحدود بالشبهات, is to word off these hudud, these directives or these punishments with any kind of misconception or shubha or misunderstanding as you word it off. That, that's just how clear Islam makes it. Uh, I think point number two that's worth mentioning is that there is a lot of nuance when it comes to the idea of apostasy. 
It's not just any random person, right? The Qadi will ask that person, why are you leaving? Some people might actually admit it's simply for monetary reasons. It's simply for the, and I know this might you know, cause people to chuckle. Some people leave Islam because they want to come to the U.S. They want a green card. They're looking for a better life. It's not necessarily I'm leaving Islam because I want to, or some people might genuinely leave Islam because they don't agree with it. They, they disagree with it. So I'm not here to negate that sector. They do exist out there. Right. Uh, point number three, when we talk about the nuance, the hadith is there. Man baddala dinahu faqtulu. That is a, it's a, a, a sound hadith. However, there are other ulama that define this differently. And, and inshallah ta'ala, I can clarify that quickly. Umar radiallahu anhu in the Musannaf uh, uh, Abdul Razak. Umar radiallahu anhu asks Anas ibn Malik. He says, Ma fa'ala nafar min Bani Bakr. The people of Bani Bakr, the six individuals of Bani Bakr, what happened to them? Anas radiallahu anhu, he says, Qadr taddu wa lahiqu bil mushrikeen. They left Islam and they joined the disbelievers, right? So, Umar radiallahu anhu, and then he says, Ma sabiluhum illa al qatl. The only thing that ought to be done to them is for them to be killed. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, La in akhatuhum silman ahabu ilayya mimma talat alihi shams. Umar radiallahu anhu says that if they came back to me peacefully, right, would be very, very beloved to me. So Anas radiallahu anhu was intrigued by that because it wasn't it wasn't a response he was expecting from, from Umar. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, Ya Umar, إن أتوك سلما فما كنت صانعا بهم. Oh Umar, if these six came back to you peacefully, right? What would you do with them? He says أعرض عليهم الباب الذي خرجوا منه. He says that if they came back to me peacefully, wanting to accept Islam, I would open the door for them that they left from, meaning Islam, right? He says وإلا سجنوا, or they would be put in prison. Now. Al-Thawri, Al-Imam Sufyan Al-Thawri, and also Ibrahim Al-Nakha'i, right? Two, two schools of thought. They believe that Yustatab Abada, meaning that this person, the apostate, this person, would be left in prison and they would constantly be reminded of coming back to Islam, but they would not be killed. Now, this is a position taken by uh, Ibrahim Al-Nakha'i and also Sufyan uh, Al-Thawri. Now, there's more clarification. Because in Al-Nasa'i, in the Sunan Al-Kubra, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, لا يحل دم ممرئ مسلم إلا بإحدى ثلاث الزان المحصن الذي قتل عمدا والذي حارب الله ورسوله Right? Three people. One is the person who's caught in adultery. The other person is someone who kills someone else intentionally. And the other person is harab, is someone who's fighting Allah and his messenger in public. In public, meaning that they are rebellious. They're, they're holding arms against the government, against the Muslim government, right? Here you could say Allah and his messenger. Now, a shawkani, a shawkani actually offers something here. Because the person who leaves Islam, he says that this right here is the specifier of the hadith. Right, the hadith, this here, it sheds light on the other hadith because here it specifies and it clarifies the hadith that says, and the person who leaves Islam while fighting Allah and His Messenger. So now we're talking about people who are rebellious, people who are out in public, people who are making a name for themselves. These are the people that Islam has a problem with. People are. Uh spreading corruption uh, treachery who are who are treacherous this is considered treachery yep yeah. so you're going you're going against the government now if you were if you leave islam and you apostate and you want to keep it between you yourself and your own four walls we don't have the inquisition we don't have a a police that's going to come to your house and double check to make sure are you praying or not there's no, no like such, inquisitions like no mahakim had. taftish there's no such thing as mahakim taftish in islam Right? The Muslim government is not going to come and make sure are you praying or not. That's between you and Allah. Now, if you come out in public and you want to publicize this, then that becomes a problem. Right? Because now you're in the public sphere. Now you are, what you're doing is you're, in, you're, you're influencing negatively other people. Right, and as Brother Daniel and even Brother uh, Jake have mentioned in, 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 in their uh, podcast, is that what they've done what they've done is they clearly show that this is in the Old Testament. So, you know, this reminds me of the verse in Matthew where it says, how can you go to your neighbor wanting to pull the speck out of their eye while you have a log in yours? Mm -hmm. Right? So, I, I mean, there are many Jake, ways... Jake pointed that out really clearly, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in your book. The law is there. And of course, if we're going to say that Jesus is God, 
then you would have to concede that that's the all love and peaceful Jesus who commanded that command. And then how would you equate uh, then also Daniel made it clear that this is something in the canon law. Like people, some even Christians don't understand, well, canon law, what is that? How would you equate that with with uh, Islamic um, in Islamic jurisprudence? Like what is, when you say canon law, what's that equivalent to in Islam? That's like the fiqh, the canon law? Yeah, yeah, you, 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 yes. Uh, you reminded me of something here b yeah. before. Uh, you reminded me, and I cannot believe... Daniel, not Daniel, but uh, Robert Spencer or even the other uh, Rashid Hamami would bring this this up as an objection yeah. because when you look at hi historically speaking, um, there were people who were burnt at the stake for doing what appeared to be what one would think to be a noble act. So, for example, William Tyndale. Yeah. Right. Here's a here's a scholar who translated the Bible from Greek to English. So now the English-speaking world has access to this to this Bible, right? This person was burnt for that. He was accused of what? He was accused of apostasy burned, and huh? or heresy. He was burnt. Yeah. Another person, they had so much hate and resentful towards him, John Wycliffe, because of certain heresies that he uttered or came, uh, 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 was kind of claiming out there. After being, subhanAllah, Keep this in mind. After being buried for four decades, for 40 years, they decided to exhume and take out his body and have him burnt to allow his ashes to be thrown away. I mean, this much resentful. And this, this wasn't like a couple, one off or two off. This happened for hundreds of years, didn't Th it? This happened for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. the church was, I don't want to say notorious. I, I want to be fair. We have to be fair, fair right? Yeah. I don't want to say the, chur the church was notorious, but it, it definitely wasn't a one oddball exceptional. Can, so can you, like, if you equate that with Islam, like, do we have years of people going out, like the Inquisitions, where they're checking you, and then if you didn't, you know, go ahead and profess um, to be... A, of, the, of certain, this faith that they would kill you, like did you go? Around, did they, the Muslims go around checking people's hearts or no. checking their iman or checking their faith? Or do we have like you know documented where you have thousands of people now dying because no they were apostate or what there, something there, similar there, to the witch burning or yeah the, no no in Islam there's alhamdulillah there's no such thing in Islam. Yeah. If it's between you and Allah, then that remains between you and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now, when you bring it out to the public sphere. That becomes a problem. Yeah. And a lot of people don't seem to really understand this, is that when you're in the public arena, when you're in the public space, and someone calls you out on something, you cannot say, who are you to judge? But do we have a lot of cases of these? Do no. We, do, do we have Islamically a lot of cases? Just like the During, amputation of the hand, uh, or the, you know, the stoning that they bring up, you cannot even find, like, you know... Some you have very very small percentage like during the lifetime, not even a percentage it doesn't even hit it's during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there was no he there was no apostasy law yeah from my understanding even when the Prophet ali sallallahu wasallam himself right there are other laws that were carried out for other reasons right but someone simply leaving Islam. No, like we have the, 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 the story of Abdullah ibn Abi Sarah. He left Islam but then came back. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu granted him asylum, but the Prophet sallallahu didn't demand for him to be killed. But I think one thing, a distinction, and I think the barrier or the marker here, the differentiating marker is, is this person being a rabble rouser out in public or not? Mm -hmm. If you're keeping it between you yourself and your own four walls, as is the case with other sins, do you. Now, if you're bringing it out in public, then that becomes a different story. Yeah. If you don't mind. But do you know what's funny is that Rashid Hamami comes full force, him and his buddy Robert Spencer, they come full force thinking they're really onto something big, like they've hit the jackpot, right? You, are, have you ever heard of uh, uh, Sister Batul uh, Haddad? Batul Haddad was a Christian woman who accepted Islam from Jordan in 2014. If you do just a, a Google research about what happened to this woman, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept her as a martyr, her bones were broken by her own family members. Wow. Her own family members. And then her head was crushed. And I'm not trying to be cinematic here. Wallahi, Allah is my witness. This is not what I'm here for. Her head was crushed by a rock. Why? Because she left Christianity and embraced Islam. So, People are applying this. Now, of course, we Muslims wouldn't do that. You had this recent inc incident with the um, Egyptian lady. It, yes. She came out and she was smiling and she testified there's nothing worthy of worship to the creator of heavens and the earth, Allah, and Muhammad is the final messenger. This is the shahada. She yes. came out.
اشهدوا ان محمد رسول الله وبنقول ولد الصليب اهو ده كمان الصليب عشان ايه؟ الصليب ده خيره يا مريم؟ قول اه مش كده مش عايز تبص لي ليه يا مريم؟ بص يا مريم 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 By the church. And the church came, kidnapped her. This is in Egypt. Yeah. And then they took her back and did what they did to like bring her back. And she's like, you know, gloomy. She's not even looking up. And I wonder what even happened. And to Allahu her Alam, what happened What's to her? What's going yeah. on with her now? And this uh, is not a one off. This, these are things that are happening, but you don't have major press covering this. Imagine if this was like uh, a Muslim, someone happened. This was a Muslim who did that right now. It'll be kid. all over the news. Yeah. Fox News, MSNBC. Yeah. Um, I mean, you name it, it will be out there. Here, here's, I think this. A lot of people might not be able to relate to this. Like for a lot of people, it's hard for them to kind of grapple with this idea. And I, I can somewhat understand why that is. You remember during COVID, during COVID, mm -hmm. we had the pandemic, yes. right? When that happened, slowly but surely, there was a different narrative that was coming out about the vaccines, right? And so what happened later on is the government started to clamp down on a lot of these I guess if you want to call them quote unquote false narratives about the vaccine and what the vaccine does and what it doesn't do, right? So then you have fact checks. So in other words, if you're posting something that goes against the dominant narrative, what ends up happening is your post is going to be canceled. Your, forgive me, your post will either be deleted, your account will be closed. In other words, there, there's, there's, there's going to be consequences if you're posting something that goes against the general dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. What dominant narrative is that? Is, hey, vaccines are, are good for you. We're doing this, we're mandating these vaccines because we're looking out for the best interest of our, our citizens and we want them to be vaccinated. Anything other than that is not tolerated. It's no different. If if the government is looking out for the health of its citizens, right? And I know some people might chuckle at that, right? Um, regardless of where you're at on that discussion or that conversation, let's just assume, forgive us for argument's sake, that the government is truly looking out for the best health of its citizens or its constituents. Let's assume that. Okay, Islam here prevents a person who's a rabble rouser, who's spreading false information, who's in sight and violence in in sight and violence against the government or who is negatively influencing other people trying to drag them from islam because as muslims it's an it's an obvious giver it's basic islam that the only safe door out of this world is believing there's no god worthy of worshiping except allah and that muhammad is his final messenger so if the government is worried about the well-being of its citizens here in the world we say islam does this censorship in the public arena because it is safeguarding its citizens in the afterlife from eternal hell. Mm -hmm. So why is it fair here? And people today, when this was happening, Akhi Ari, people were reporting. You have a lot of health officials who would report an account, right? To fact check. Why? Because they don't agree with the dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. Oh, this guy has to be censored. So this idea of, again, this idea of, oh, free speech, there's really no such thing as yeah. absolute free speech. And people can understand, like when you talk about treason and treachery, and uh, when you define what is treachery, violation of faith, betrayal of trust, treason. So example, if somebody is coming out and maybe you don't agree with everything of the Constitution, but now you're coming in and becoming an opponent to the Constitution and trying to get people to come and change it and right. go against it. Right. What, what do you think they're going to do to you? Yeah, right. that, it's the same. It's the same concept. What's going to happen? It's the same concept. Yeah, so people can kind of someone understand. I want to bring out uh, one main um, public uh, speaker, a, a someone who's also been asked this question. Get your con get your uh, reaction to it, and see uh, what um, what your thoughts on. Sure, sister, you said the Quran says that a person who's born as a Muslim and he changes his religion, he's put to death. Sister, I don't know of any verse in the Quran. You point out in the Quran, there's no such verse in the Quran talking about that a person who is a Muslim and then who changes his faith, he should be put to death. But there are certain rulings. But if you go back to the history, the theory of the Prophet Muhammad we know that 
when the Prophet went to Medina, there was one Sahaba who came and said that when the Prophet said, go and kill these kafirs, they're causing problems, they are the enemies. So one of the Sahaba said that please forgive my brother. And the Prophet didn't kill him. And later on that person accepted Islam. So it's not a general rule that any person who's a Muslim who becomes a murtad, he has to be put to death. The ruling is if a person who is a Muslim, who becomes a murtad, who changes his faith and propagates against the religion of Islam, then the penalty is death. And this is in most of the countries. For example, if in the country of India, there's a citizen of India who shares the secret prince of the Indian army with the enemy. The Indian law will say he should be put to death or life imprisonment. This is the same law in America, same in UK for apostasy. The same law that is there that if you sell your some secret of the country, either death penalty or life imprisonment. So in Islam, it is not a normal ruling that a person who is a Muslim, when he becomes a non-Muslim, he should be put to death. Only if he propagates against Islam and conspires against Islam, then is the ruling. Uh, what are your thoughts? So this is a mainstream, uh, how would you, Dr. Zakir Naik, mm -hmm. every Muslim knows him. You know Dr. Yeah, Zakir Naik? Come on, what a question. Who doesn't, <laughs> who doesn't know him, right? So him commenting on that so people can see like, okay, uh, it's pretty much a straight answer throughout. Uh, I think, well, like, it's quite logical. Yeah. It's really quite logical. If you're keeping to you yourself. You brought that on so people can see like, okay, it's like you have your interpretation. I have, it's pretty much standard uh, response, right? Yeah. 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 Anything else you want to? No, I, I just want, I, I think a lot of people have this, th this other idea that they're pushing is that, oh, Muslim, like my mom's side of the family, my mom's side of the family is Christian. My father's side of the family is Muslim, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, this idea that, oh, Muslims can't be friends with Christians, right? We can't mm -hmm. be friends with, with, with Jews. There's a difference between someone being a colleague, a friend at work, someone you go to school with, and someone where we're talking about taking them as allies. This is, this is a, th there's a huge distinction between the two. This has nothing to do, right, with being, you know, our religion, we have to be nice. We have to be, even if we, we, we differ on the grounds of faith, like my mom's side of the family, you're telling me that I'm conspiring to get rid of them. Why? Because they're Christians. No, I still have to love them. I have to respect them. I have to give them their rights and so on and so forth, right? And the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, contrary to popular belief by a lot of these Islamophobes, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was that. He dealt with people differently. At times you'll find he was, and this is what wisdom is, by the way. The Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam during his seerah, you'll find there were times when he, when he was passive. At times he was assertive. And at times he was aggressive and each and every man and male figure. And this is kind of my area, by the way, this is you as a man. This is what you have to understand. There are times in life that are going to require and necessitate of you to be passive. Sometimes you have to be assertive and sometimes you have to be aggressive, not because you want to be aggressive, but because the moment dictates that you be aggressive. So there's a place and time for everything. I'm afraid what the Dawah of America has done is that we're starting to be viewed as these pushovers, as these yes men. And we just have to smile when someone hits us. And then we have to say Islam is about peace. And then we give them the other cheek. I'm sorry, that is not Islam. This is against human nature. Mm -hmm. Right. The Prophet, Ali salatu wasalam, there were certain people he dealt with. Right. But depending on how they dealt with him. Mm -hmm. So I'll just give you an example. Right. He was invited by a Jewish man. The Prophet ﷺ was invited by a Jewish man. Do you know what, what he was invited for? He was not invited for this tantalizing five-star restaurant. He was invited for ihalatin wa khubz sha'ir. Right? Ihalatin sanikha wa khubz sha'ir. Barley bread and like some very old. That it's a dish that is so old, its odor can be smelled. So the Prophet ﷺ went and he accepted the invitation of a Jewish man. He didn't say with all the things that you Jews have done to me. No. I won't. He even went to the Jewish woman who ended up putting some right, uh, poison in his food. But she, he accepted her invitation as well. right? So the Prophet wasallam dealt with people differently. You right. had the uh, example. We spent a lot of time on this. We'll get to the next one mm -hmm. in, a, in a minute. Sure. You had the procession of the funeral and it was a Jewish man. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he stood up, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He said, this is a Jewish man. His companions were saying, this is uh, pretty much a Jew. He said, isn't that a human soul? <laughs> Some of the yeah, some of the companions they were in Al Qadisiya from what I remember, and some of the companions stood up, and then some of them were surprised. Well, why are you standing up? They said there was a a, a funeral that passed by the Prophet and then he stood up, 
And when asked, he said, Alayset nafsa? They said, it's Jew. It's a Jewish soul. This, the, the rebuttal was, the answer was, is it not a nafs? Is it not a human being? Yes. Uh, Nawawi, for example, he says, Hada ala ibaha, that it's permissible to do that. Honoring, not because you're honoring the Jewish faith or the Christian faith. No, it's because you're honoring. Because Allah says, Wala qad karramna bani Adam. We have indeed honored the human Adamic being. Yes. Not necessarily specifically Muslims, right? لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. We have indeed honored the Adamic human being. And these guys would have you leaving it off like, you know, Muslims are barbarians, just violent. They hate Jews and they they just all about, you know, give, sticking one to you in your back. We want the best for, <laughs> listen, <laughs> we want the best for everyone. Uh -huh. We do. But don't think that you're going to, don't think that you're going to come at us sideways and we're going to tell you here's the other cheek. But I do. I mean, it's it's uh, the truth that if you want peace, you gotta ha you get the peace from the owner of peace, the Creator of heavens and earth. And doing Islam will get you that way. Peace acquired by submitting your will to the Creator of heavens and earth. Is this correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. Let's move on. <clears throat> he didn't. He said in in the law, tooth for tooth, and he said no. You turn the other cheek. Jesus stopped the Old Testament. They don't have a New Testament in Islam. They have worse than the Old Testament. They have something that uh, Muhammad never corrected. So today we have to do jihad. Biggest difference with Christianity because Jesus came and he stopped the Old Testament. He stopped every, he, he didn't stone the lady who committed adultery. Okay, so that's the uh, the next, out of the uh, variety of bullets that he's shooting. This is another one. Yeah, the, the, you know, it's quite, it's quite laughable, honestly. And I don't say this to be uh, out of, you know, mockery or to be condescending, but it's quite laughable for someone such as Rashid Hamami, who has dedicated his entire life, his entire career, all of his time and energy to, to refuting Islam and to, 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 uh, uh, as you said, spit bullets at Islam, how he's not aware of this story being fabricated. He lives without sins, let him cast the first stone. That that was not in the original of John. And that, that's why the brackets are there. And it says this is not found in the oldest or the most reliable manuscripts. This story of the adulterous woman is only found in the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. right? Um, in Bart Ehrman, who I'm sure you're very uh, familiar with. People, of course, call the Gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who wrote these books, and there's no point calling them Sam, Fred, Jerry, and Harry. I mean, they're, they're written by people we don't know who they were written by. They are anonymous. You might not think so because they have the title, The Gospel According to Matthew. Whoever put that title on it was an editor later. The followers of Jesus were Aramaic-speaking peasants from Galilee, lower-class men who were not educated. In fact, Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 verse 13 are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Of course not. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write. And their native language was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated, rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition. Yeah. May Allah guide him to Islam, by the way. I mean... Um, um, he, here, here you have Bart Ehrman, who's arguably the world's leading expert when it comes to biblical textual criticism. He says that this was not found in the original manuscripts, and it was not put in the, 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 the Gospel of John until the 10th century. Right. So, and, and here you have someone such as, uh, su such as uh, Rashid Hamami saying, oh, no, you know what, this put an end. You have centuries of uh, uh, law-abiding uh, Jewish people, the Jewish civilization, live in accordance to the law of God. Suddenly, we're going to put an end to that because of a fabricated story. And the other story is, oh, give to Jesus what belongs to Jesus, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Suddenly, these two passages are going to nullify centuries of living and upholding God's law. Right? I, I find this to be quite laughable. The other thing too is that when you try to when he when he says something about Jesus no longer applying the law that that is an utter lie. That's a lie. That is an utter lie. Yeah. There is no such thing of that. In fact, each and every passage when Jesus speaks about the New Testament. In fact, when Jesus in one passage, I believe it's in Matthew, when Matthew, he's asked, yes. I'm sorry, that's in Matthew. Yes, I yeah. Know what when he's asked about the kingdom of heaven, he refers to the law. He refer he says not one jaw should one not one jot of that law should be moved. So Jesus oftentimes when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven or eternal life, 
He never says, don't worry, I'm here to die for your sins. He constantly replies with keeping keep the commandments, keep the commandments, yes. which is the same thing as we Muslims. So it's very laughable as to how he would use this and say that um, <clears throat> the law no longer applies. If you want to get a better understanding, uh, 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 Eddie, as to what happened, simply look at where the where the letter of uh, James, who's supposed to be the Lord's brother, just look at where his letter is shoved all the way back in the New Testament. Does not does that not raise many red flags? It should, but do you know why it's back there? Because it praises keeping the law. Yes, it speaks about keeping the law, and that if you're that your deeds, if you're just saying it, it, then it's in vain. Because what you say and what you profess and proclaim, it has to be backed up by your deeds. Right. And so for here, here's the thing. For thousands of years, the Jews have been living under God's law. It, this is not theory. This is not a trial period. We're talking about generations. One after the other grew up believing that the way to God, the way to eternal uh, uh, to, to eternal pleasure and bliss with God is by keeping the commandments. Now, does God know that the Jews and Christians are going to fall short? Yes. So believing in God and, and believe in that God is a loving God. These are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Th does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So believing that there's a law that you have to apply does not negate that God is a loving God. So, for example, when God in the Old Testament talks about all of these commandments, whether it's stoning the adulteress, the adulterer, whether it's um, uh, the, the regardless of what akam that you have in the Old Testament, I got a question for you. The person, the God who revealed all of those commandments, was that a loving God? Yes, it was a loving God, right? In other words, the response that we get today is Christians conveniently say, oh, that's the Old Testament. See, they're, they're depicting God like a person who was in his early teens, did some very silly things. And all of a sudden they've grown up, they've matured, they moved on and they're no longer that person. I got news for you. This is not how we deal with God. God is not looking back at the Old Testament in this. Some people might not find this to be appropriate, but I'm going to do it just so it's clarified better. God is not looking at the Old Testament and saying, "Oh, I was awfully rushed back then. I was I was awfully rough back then. I was awfully harsh back then. I've changed. I guess that way really doesn't work anymore." You can't do that because when we're talking about God's love, and this gets to be a little bit intricate, when we're talking about God being a merciful, loving God, this is this is God's attribute, and God's attributes are eternal. So it, it's beyond me as to how Christians have a problem with Allah being a loving and merciful God and still having certain penal codes that are a little bit harsh, mm -hmm. but they're okay with God revealing these laws in the Old Testament. Yes, you can say that's the Old Testament God, but God's nature, fundamental nature, which is loving and being merciful, this is a part of who he is. This is not a commandment. So if God can, that loving God, if he can reveal those laws thousands of years ago, why are you looking at Islam in Allah now saying that, oh, this is no longer a loving God? If he did it before, why can't he do it again? Mm -hmm. So people have to get this idea out of their mind that God's love and following the law are mutually exclusive. They're not. These two have ran, they have run in parallel, in unison, in tandem for thousands of years in the Old Testament. Why is it suddenly a surprise and a shock now? Mm -hmm. does, does that make yes. sense? Because people will say, oh, we're under grace. We Muslims believe in the concept of grace. The Prophet Muhammad, والسلام, when, he's, when he was with his companions, he says, no one will enter paradise with his or her deeds. The companions, they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, no, only that Allah embraces me with his grace. So we believe that our deeds, it's a way, it's simply a way to show God, I tried. I did my yes. best. I did what I could. Mm -hmm. But it's not to say that your deeds equate God's blessings because our deeds, they're finite. God's pleasure, God's blessing, and the eternity in, in, in Allah's company, that's infinite. Mm -hmm. It's never ending. One last thing when it comes to the law, please. When he says here that God's law stopped, what do you do with the crime? See, there are crimes 
that were committed during the lifetime of Jesus. There were crimes that were committed during the Old Testament. And God, it's funny because God of the, the God of the Old Testament had wanted to have a say in each and every aspect of your life. How to deal with your crops, how to divorce, how to get married, what to do when you sell, what to do when you buy, when a woman is on her menses, when, when, when a woman is off, being ceremonially clean and so on and so forth. So the Lord of the Old Testament is literally identical to the Lord of the New Testament, right? So the million dollar question here is, what do you do with those crimes that were committed during the Old Testament that still perpetuate with us today? How do you deal with those? Is this not Christianity turning its back on God's divine law that should be literally enveloped in wisdom, in infinite wisdom? Are you guys not turning your backs on that and saying, well, we have democracy now. We have a better way of dealing with these problems. Mm -hmm. Is this not what Christianity is doing? Mm. Yes. This is the point that Daniel was making that people, them... And others today are not living by actually the tenets and principles of Christianity. They're more going towards liberalism, and they're getting overcome by that. So this is not you're not coming at it from a Christian, actual traditional sense. You're coming at it from liberal secularism. I just I really urge each and every Christian to kind of pump their brakes a bit when they say this. Yeah. Oh, we no longer believe in the Old Testament laws. Well, that that God of the Old Testament, he gave you laws to live. And abide by. Mm -hmm. When you say that we're no longer going to apply those, you say because what Hamim, uh, Hamim, uh, forgive me, what's his name? Uh, yeah. Hamim, uh, the, not Hamim, the hate provocateur. Go ahead. Yeah, the hate provoc provocateur. When he says, "Oh, that's the Old Testament," you can't just rub it off like that. You you can't just conveniently dismiss that and throw it in the closet and they close throw the it door. Under, they throw the Bible under the bus. You yeah. cannot do that. You have certain crimes that were committed back then, but guess what? They're still being committed today. But back then, those Jews dealt with these crimes according to God's laws. Today, you're dealing, as Christians, you guys are dealing with these same crimes, moral they are or not, with a completely different way. Mm -hmm. With a tool of whatever you want to call it, democracy, liberalism, you have it. I don't think that's something to be proud of. No, I don't think that's something that what, should be celebrated. What I would ask, we had a lot of people from Morocco who were really questioning. They were like, what? I mean... Right now, somebody, going back to what he was saying earlier, but even this, him just being a fake Christian, I believe he's somebody who, if you go back and we were implored people from Morocco to go do some investigating, to try to find, we like to talk to his father, actually. You know, he said his father was an imam and whatnot, yeah. and he's bringing all this stuff up. It's the classical story. It's, we were yeah. born, we were brought up devout Muslims, and suddenly I, we saw the light, and Jesus spoke to me, and now I'm a Christian. I think I think uh, there should be an investigation to find his family, to find I, his father. I second that. I second that, third that, and get some people from Morocco to go ahead and see if they can talk with his family to really see, uh, like they did the Wali Shuhabat and these other guys, to, to really find him out. To, and, and, to show what an imposter that he he, he is because this guy is really he's spreading a lot of uh, hate corruption misinformation he's not doing a, the world a good service and as, a, as an as an apologist as a polemicist it's, it's I'm not gonna lie it's somewhat of a disgrace I mean this is we're not talking about someone in his early 20s early teens doing this we're talking about someone who spent decades doing this yeah. but he's still making very silly ABC rudimentary uh, mistakes when it comes to to yeah. Islam yeah, um, so let's continue on. He had many wives, 11 of them. One of them, she was nine years old. He was 53. I am 50. I cannot marry a girl that has nine years old. You cannot. That's abuse. And Muhammad did that. Can we do uh, one, so many one things. issue uh, let, me, let, let, me, issue let me finish time. this. He took, he raided a Jewish tribe. Keep going or stop, he yeah. sounds extremely, extremely desperate. Like he's he's got so much of this 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 hate inside of them inside of him. First, l l let us take this. By the way, I've done a video about this uh, on my by your permission um, on yes, my channel yes. on my channel. You've uh, covered a lot of these, huh? I I've covered this subject specifically on. Uh, and, and I clear. want people to know we're just basically touching upon you know in a short amount of time touching upon some of these things. But if someone wants to go deeper into these topics, I mean, because that's what they want to do. They want to just throw it out there and they stun you, shock you. And then when these things are unpackaged, you'll be like, well, okay, it's a right. totally different perspective now. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've done an, an in-depth video about this. Um, it's uh, Your Prophet Married a Nine-Year-Old. It's on Tabsira Project, uh -huh. T-A-B-S-I-R-A, -A, and then Project. Um, you'll find it on there. But let us, I, I don't know where to start with this because it, it could be, it can go in so many dimensions and different angles. And there's a lot, there's a, a, so many different ways you can approach this, huh? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he married Aisha radiallahu anha, 
first off, you have some Muslims who believe she was nine, and you have some Muslims who take the position that she was actually 18 mm-hmm. and not nine. For me as what a about Muslim, Uthman, though... What about Uthman ibn Farooq? He makes a good case. He's not changing anything, sure. but he talks about that uh, there's some conflict of from her herself. It's not in the Quran. It's not in the Hadith. Again, we're not whitewashed anything. Sure, this is what sure. it is, it is. Right. If, it's, if it's that, it's that. It's no problem. But right. uh, Sheikh Uthman ibn Farooq, he talks about, and just summarize, I hope I don't chop this up, uh, but you can go watch his video on it. And he talks about how they didn't have calendars at that time, how they didn't have, and he doesn't say she's 18, but he just says, look, we don't get this in Quran uh, or from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi We get it from her. Then uh, we get also from her sister that puts her deaf at a l- later age. So he says if she's 9, 10, 11, you know what I mean? It doesn't uh, affect your faith now. It's like if you, at the end, if you believe she's... It doesn't have any... The- yeah, that's, that's theological... It doesn't have any theological this bearing is, or any theological implications. Yeah. For me, if she was 9, I, I'm, I'm still happy being a devout Muslim. If she was 18, I'm still happy being a devout yes. Muslim. But here's one thing that people have to... C- really really seriously keep in mind we muslims when we speak about the age of aisha we are being descriptive not prescriptive Mm -hmm. we're not out here because people when they talk about this it's as if you have all these crazy nutcase fathers who are dying to marry their daughters at the age of nine because they want to quote unquote imitate prophet muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is not what we're doing. That's not happening today. No, no one is. And if, if someone came to my, if someone came asking for my daughter, which is funny because my daughter is, is going, uh, she, literally she'll be nine next year. I'm not going to marry her to someone even in his early 20s. I don't think no, no Muslim right now is going to do that. That's what I'm saying. That's so people are latching on to this as if it's the be all and end all. It's the jackpot. And yeah. oh, Islam cannot be true. No, Islam can be true. Not understanding the wisdom behind certain things doesn't mean it never happened. Like when you're at an intersection in the middle of nowhere in rural America and you see a stop sign, you don't say, no one must have put this here. No. You don't understand the wisdom as to why it is here in the middle of nowhere, but you believe deep inside that it was put there by someone. Mm-hmm. But you don't immediately assume and say, oh, this must have just spontaneously landed here, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the same thing. So I want to re- reiterate that one more time. When we speak about this, we're not being prescriptive. We're just dis- being descriptive. We're just describing a situation that happened. This is something that happened during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. There are, again, there are a lot of variables to, to, to consider. One of the many things is that the Prophet ﷺ was accused of of a lot of things. He was accused of being a liar by his enemies. He was accused of being a soothsayer. He was accused of being a sorcerer. He was accused of a lot of a lot of things, right? A lot of horrible things. Well, the one thing he was not accused of is, I, and I don't even want to say it out of respect and reverence for Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. he wasn't accused of being a, a P. I'm just going to say the P word. Yeah. I don't, I, and some people might even Simp. laugh at this. No. Pe- say, pe- oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't oh, even want to say. Oh. Yeah. Okay, you have Muslims. You have some Muslims. His enemies never, ever use that against him. No. Isn't that something that just now came up in the 21st century? It, Even if is, you go back, this you is know, very Christian recent. Orientalists, yes. 100, 200 years ago, they weren't even bringing this up, right? Yeah, the first... The this first, is a modern-day age argument now. Yes, it, 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 it didn't pop up until... I, I, it, it's in my... Yeah, I'd say about the turn of the 19th century, early uh-huh. 19th century, late 19th century, forgive me, uh, early 20th century, give or it take. Could, it couldn't come up because then you'd have to go ahead and condemn the founding fathers. That was that was, that was was quite common to marry daughters off at a very, very early age. So it wasn't even at that time, the Islamophobes at that time, if there were, they weren't even bringing this up. Yeah, there were many things that you could attack and criticize But Islam you're talking for. about his enemies who tried everything at his time 1,400 years ago to discredit him. They never brought this up. They, they could have used it, but they never. They accused him of a lot of things. Yeah. Right? They accused him of a lot of things, but they did not want to accuse him of, oh, how can this man be a prophet from God as all of you are claiming, but at the same time marry a girl at the age of nine? Ruqayya, Ruqayya was the sister, was the uh, uh, one of the daughters of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was married at the age of 10, mm-hmm. right? I think I think the problem is this, is that we really, some people when they speak, they really give you the impression that the world started to exist 50, 60 years ago. Hello, please, for the love of God. So this is called that presentism, right? Presentism. They're, they're judging it by now the context of today. Yes. If, if, listen, if average Americans were exhumed and resurrected and came back from their graves 100 years ago, and they saw how we as Americans were living or are living today, they would all have a heart attack and be exactly where they're, where they're at right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to be satirical or funny, but they would literally have an instantaneous heart attack and not believe that this is the America that they once lived, mm-hmm. lived in. 
Yeah. yeah. You have the, uh, so just to push this even further, we can go on and on, but I mean, there's just so many points here. You can look at the, the um, Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Catholic Encyclopedia has her at twelve, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then and, and then uh, Joseph was tw twice the ninety, age. I think ninety. Yeah, eighty nine years that in old. The so he yeah. was twice double the age of the prophet. So some yeah. peace be upon him. Yeah. So how do you how do you rectify that? Yeah. And then some even say like, but who got her? They think they say God got her pregnant. So is God? I mean, I mean, can you get the point? And some even argue. But you get that point? Yes, yes. That God actually at the twelve age got her pregnant. So is God what you're claiming, Prophet Muhammad is? Is that does it sink in? I and, mean, and, are people out of your mind. And by the way, by the way, it was a woman. And I mentioned this in my video. It was it was someone, it was someone who came to the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam proposing Aisha as yeah. a suitable candidate. Now, I, listen, she I, was already engaged to be married. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. And someone else, he didn't go after. after no, the Prophet no. Ali it was, Someone else recommended. Yes, it was Khawla uh, bint Hakim who came and tried to intercede as a shafa'atun shafa hasana. But yeah. the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, so, also some ulama so. say that um, that he saw her sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a, in a dream. And he says, yeah. in kana hadha min indi Allahi he, And he, he, when he would see her in a dream that he was married to her, he would say that if this is from Allah, then it will definitely transpire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you have um, the what she actually went on to. Okay, so we know that she was engaged already. That was the norm, the culture of the time. It was something, if you go back, even in this country, you had Delaware, I believe it was seven, Massachusetts, 10. When you break down and you look at the the age of marriage here in the United States, that's why I said yeah, if you seven, talk about you have some uh, as, Delaware some was as seven. nine, some as some seven. nine, yeah. 10. And then if you don't even want to go that far back, and this was on the laws, and it's still on some of the laws until right. today. If you want to go just a little bit back, you got Sweet 16. You heard of the Sweet 16? Mm -hmm. Why did they say Sweet yeah, 16? Because right. she's ready. She's supposed to be ready for marriage. Yeah. I think in the Latino culture, it's Sweet 15. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So, and that's that's just, what is that? That's maybe like a few years back, 10, a dec not even a decade. Yeah. Because they were thinking, okay, now she's at this age. She's, mar she's marriage age, right? But if the more further you go back, you got kings and, and and queens, and you have Catholic, the church, and everybody. They were actually, it was in line at that age, right. puberty, yeah, at puberty. And this is what it is, Islamic. What is it? It's maturity and puberty. Yeah, this I mean, is that, the gui this that, is the, the guiding uh, light on this. That's the factor because a lot of people, they, they you know, what's funny is as um here's how far we've gotten with this is that people when they look at the age of eighteen, uh, people have to keep in mind that eighteen is not a biblically inspired number. Mm -hmm. There, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it's maturity, puberty that is the benchmarker for getting married. So people have to stop idolizing this eighteen as because some people, when when it's a relationship, it, yes, it's the law. But someone coming from a faith background, I'm not sure why you would look at that eighteen as a sacred number and say, "Oh my God." That's something that they put in place, right? Legislators put in place, believing that that's the ideal age. But it's not a, you know, and again, the world did not come into existence 50, 60 years ago. There are different cultures. There are different norms. There are different, the world operates quite differently from culture to culture. I've given this example before. I mean, if you look at in the history, you had generals. Often you think of a general today. What's the average age of a general today? You would never think that a general would be like 17, 18, 19 years old. Oh, not at but, all. But we have generals in Islamic history at yes. that age, right? Mm -hmm. Muhammad yes. al fati what was he, like 20? Give or take, yes. Something around 20 years old, 21, something yes. like that. During the time of the Prophet, so something Usama, had, Usama bin Zaid. How old was he? Was 17? 18, I think. Eight, I think he was 17. 17 18 year old, yeah. Can, he, was in lead, yeah. In the, he was leading the army. You got 17, 18 years old, they're in the basement playing Xbox. It's all relative. Right? It's relative. They can't, yeah. you got women can't cook an egg, you know what I mean? Can't boil an egg, right? Oh, boy. Oh, but, boy. so the maturity levels, you cannot judge it with the context of today with, if, uh, uh, if you're taking it back to that time, it's totally different times. It's different. And I like what you said. Nobody's trying to marry their daughter off at this. At, yeah, I mean, at, we have to stop making it sound as if you have these Muslims all around the world dying to marry their daughters off at the age of nine. It's mm -hmm. not happening. Yeah. And understandably so. Times are different. Wow. So, uh, But at the end of the day, though, let us keep in mind, mm -hmm. it is a marriage. Here's the funny never thing. Never had a girlfriend. Here's the funny thing. Here's the fun Here, yes. let, let me say this for a minute because I think this really has to be said. Yes. Today, people are... People of, of varying different faith backgrounds know that fornication is an abomination. Fornication, living, having intimacy with a different person, pr 
prior to marriage, outside the scope of marriage or the union of marriage, is considered an egregious sin in the sight of God. Okay, you have some people who are living in sin happily. They're, they're actually unaware that they're even committing an atrocious sin of this caliber. But then we'll look at the the, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, or perhaps even look at this marriage in complete dismay. Oh my God, he married. Um, yeah, the key word is married. They are married. It's not a marry a marriage that you're 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 involved in. It's not something that you're used to. And hey, guess what? It's not something we we contemporary Muslims are used to either. But I'm not going to deny it. But the thing is, just look at how influenced we are by our, how we're shaped by our cultural norms. Is that you have people today who are living out of wedlock, boyfriend and girlfriend. That's like the cultural norm today. But they still, you know, they preach God. And I know I'm, I'm going to be accused of being judgmental here. But this is normal for you. But then you're going to look at the marriage of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and really find a problem with that? I, I'm not sure that really. You, is I mean, you credible. have you have when just in elementary schools like right now, you just see what's happening. It's really a shame. It's it's really um, it's something that's sad, really sad. Six. I mean, what what the average uh, uh, sixth grader is? What is that? Ten, what's the average age for for a uh, sixth grader? 10, ten, 11? ten yeah. eleven. Yeah. yeah, right. Ten eleven years old. Yeah. They're they're promiscuous. They're having uh, boyfriends. They're having sad. You know, and. A lot of the parents are accepting this. This is boyfriend, girlfriends. They're letting John come over, hang out, you know, or letting their girl Sally go to Bob and Bill. They're hanging out with the boys in the basement and stuff. What do you think is happening? What, That's what? what happens. This is exactly what happened. And I think we Muslims have to learn. We do not, and I don't say this to be arrogant. We Muslims have to learn from the mistakes of Christians. That when you stop applying and holding sacred what ought to be sacred, then you start having these problems. Because mm -hmm. then when you have these relationships outside of marriage, you get what? You get the boyfriend, girlfriend, and then what? And then you have women having children outside of wedlock. And then uh, intimacy becomes very cheap. For, for Intimacy becomes very, very cheap. And now you have men don't want to partake in any responsibility because they know they can get intimacy, extreme, not cheap, yeah. for free. No. So there's no there's no incentive to be in a marriage. There's no incentive. And this is why this whole idea of, although I don't want to drag feminism in here, but this idea of you do you and you do what a man does, well, that's going to come with, that's going to come with, it's going to backfire. And it's gonna, I think it's going to avalanche into something a, a, a lot more sinister. Her father was the best friend of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Yeah, so today, yeah. you who who right. asked the father? Where's right. the father in this whole thing? You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, he's okay with it, but you're not. You yeah. come 15 centuries later, you have a problem with it, but her father wasn't? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's time. Yeah, I think we can move La on. Last thing I want to touch upon, because we got a lot more to cover, sure. uh, the point who she went on to become. I mean, you've had people who accepted Islam uh, they had this wrapped around their mind. They couldn't figure it out. They went and studied her life. They saw her being one of the great, the greatest scholars of Islam. They saw because if someone's oppressed, if somebody's, you know, how they have this image in their mind, you know what I mean? At the end, the man dies and they're writing books against him. None of his wives, it's hard enough to satisfy one, to satisfy all his wives. Right. None of them came out to speak negatively about him. Right. And the love when he was mentioned, when they asked, when they would come to find out and study, you know, behind the veil, they would come and to learn from her. They'd say, tell us something about him, that he grew the great. She started tearing, she would start crying, not yeah. at jeers, Tears of like resentment, tears of like, I miss you, I love you, you know what I mean? It's right. just, and then people would go, women, they'd go study her life, they'd come accept Islam, and then have a child and name her daughter after Aisha. She, 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 was, she, she had a school, she had, Yani, there are books about there about Yani Fiqh Aisha, the jurisprudence of Aisha, like her Masail Faqiyya, Tata'alaq bi Aisha radiallahu anha, it had to do with her. Mm -hmm. So she was a school of thought in her own. Wow. And as you said, male scholars. And guess what? And that, that's another thing too, I think that's worthwhile mentioning is that she was young. So she was able to take that's in the wisdom a now. lot of that yes, knowledge. Not. Had she been in her 40s and 50s with respect to 40-year-old women and 50-year-old women, we're not bashing them. But when she's young, she had this eidetic memory and she was, she was ready to take all that knowledge in. Isn't this one of now the wisdoms we yes. see the scholars talk about? One of the wisdoms yes. of her also marrying the Prophet because okay. now now she went on to live and she went out to narrate yes. her her intimate detail mm -hmm. with him. You know how he how he was in every which way of a facet of and life. And the majority the majority of the hadith that come to us from his household, like the very personal matters that 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 happened between a wife and and and, and her her husband or between a couple, this is all being brought to us via. 
Aisha radiallahu anha, the overwhelming majority of a hadith that we have from Baytul Nubuwa is from Aisha radiallahu anha, not uh, other mothers of wow. the believers. I mean, this is deep. This is really deep yeah. and profound. And, yeah. uh, somebody... and this is why some ulama are convinced that this is that, that the, 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 the dream that he saw, it was actually, it, it was a dream. It was a foretelling of him to be married to Aisha radiallahu anha. Okay, let's As continue. it is in Bukhari. Let's uh, continue on. A Jewish tribe, he killed the whole family of a newly bride called Safiya. And he took her as a wife the same time he was returning to Medina. Would you put that as a role model for me today in the 21st century? Okay, I, I see. Uh, I'll let you go from here. But there's actually a prophecy in this story. In the with the wife of, Pro, of of Sophia, but go ahead, take it away. We can get into that prophecy uh, that he obviously didn't mention because he's coming at a twisted angle. Well, well, that's the thing too. I mean, he just he, I, here's the thing. If there's one thing that people can take from this is is this, and I think it's really important, right? Um, there's a saying that says a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. I know that sounds very confusing, right? A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Mm. Meaning that it's a pretext for decontextualization, for for basically making the text out as you want it to be. Yeah. Right. The story of Safiya radiallahu anha is that when Khaybar was done, and Khaybar happened right after uh, Sulh al Hudaybi. Now we're getting context. Yes. Which obviously none of them are giving. Well, well the, scholarly he, references, context. I don't think he knows what that is. Yeah. yeah that's the problem. Um. Is so. Safiya radiallahu anha, before even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, her own father, Huyay ibn Akhtab, and her am Yasir, her uncle Yasir, they went out when the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam first came to Medina, they both went out to verify if this is he, the Prophet they're waiting for or not. I want people to pay attention. This is really deep now because why are they there in this area? That's another thing before we get there. They're there what? Anticipating what? Yeah, profit, right? I, one would think, yes. They're there, and now they're going out because they know the signs. They know. but Out of all the places in the world, yeah. it, 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 that, that is another million-dollar question. But this is in the Bible also. Becca, Mecca, it's yes, there. Yeah. Yathrib, everything yes, is there. Yes. It's in the Bible. The amounts of Paran. Par it's there in the Bible, yeah, yeah. right? Is yeah. this coincidence? No, it's right there in front of you. Go ahead. Um, so they, 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 they went out, and they, fair, they, they did see that, okay, this is the long-awaited prophet that they're waiting for and, and by the way even though we're kind of going down a different avenue here there is a, a, a text of this similarity or of this sort that's found in the new testament mm -hmm. when the rabbis were asking are you john the baptist they said no they said are you the messiah they said no they said are you that, that prophet that prophet yes. so the first that's century, actually i want to plug once you said that dr Brent lawrence brown he actually uh, mentions this in his book uh godded he talks about that argument. Okay. This is a this is a Christian atheist. He went to Christianity, mm -hmm. came to Islam, accepted. I just happen to have his book here. Good friend of mine. Exactly that uh, verse, that situation. He brings up uh, quite often. Very yeah. powerful. Is it is it like you said? I think two things here to mention. Is it just really mere coincidence that out of all the places in the world, they come to Yathrib? Yeah. They come to Medina. They migrate to Medina from where Allah knows best. Uh, the second thing is, as you mentioned earlier, is that um, th th this this is known. So the Jews, first century Palestinian Jews, were still waiting for another Messiah. They were waiting for that prophet. And that prophet is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So when Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, after his advent to Mecca, when he migrated to Mecca, after being persecuted out of his own home in Mecca, he goes to Medina. When he gets to Medina, Yasser, and then her, the father of uh, Safiya, Huyayi, they both go to verify, is this the long-awaited prophet we're anticipating or not? When they saw him and they knew that this was he, they came back in utter disappointment. Now you would think, why? If that's the one, why? That's why? the golden question, why? Why? Because the Nubuwa, prophethood was taken from the Jews. Bingo. And given to the wow. Arabs. Wow, so the arrogance kicks in. He's not one of us, yes. right? And in, 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 in Safiya. He's not our skin tone, our color, our people from our tribe, right? See, yeah. Yep. That's that racism now, huh? And, and that, yeah. And that's, this is one of, and this is, I think, although we can kind of take this in many other directions, is that the truth, it can come from where you expect it the least. Wow. Sometimes your own hostile enemy 
can tell you something that's truthful. You don't disregard it simply because they're your enemy. Go back so people, they don't miss yeah. this point. Sure. They went to go see if this was the messenger. They had the, whatever they had remnants of, of the Torah. They look in, okay, this is, if, uh, this is the description. They come back. She's listening to this, right? She's listening to this conversation. And the uh, uncle says to him, is this the one? He confirms, this is the one. Yeah. And then he she, confirmed that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger that they're waiting to come. Yes. And, so and, he, and we're getting this from her. Yes, is this correct? She's wow. she's narrating this. Yeah, it's mind blowing. I agree. It's mind. This is like an imam yeah. boost. Like when you hear this, it's, it's amazing. It sounds very different than what uh, Rashid Hamami <laughs> says, right? Yeah, I mean, he, he's he's. I'm not gonna. He's a good actor, though. Yeah. I will give him a, a five star review for his acting skills. He's very animated. He's ready to start weeping. Yes. Right. Um, so continue on with the story. Now. Yeah. Okay. So. Safiya radiallahu anha, she says that usually when my uncle sees me, he's just excited, elated to pick me up and play with me. She said, this time around was very, very different, very unusual, is that when they came back, kalain, right? They were very tired, they were distraught, they were done, right? And then she overhears one speaking to the other. Yeah. Well, he is he, right? He says, yes. He says, well, what do you find in your heart? He says, adawatuhu ma baqit. The enmity is the only thing I have left for him. Wow. Yeah. In another narration, actually, by the way, she, she sees a vision. She sees a vision. She has a dream, right? In one of the narrations, Safiya radiallahu anha has a dream. And what she sees in this dream is the, the, the la lune, I want to say it in French, I don't know why, the moon uh -huh. falling in her lap. Mm -hmm. Now, she goes later on and she says this and she repeats it to her, the husband that she had at the yes. time. She says, I see the moon falling in my lap. So he automatic, automatically slaps her right center, dead in the face. He beat her up pretty bad. Yes. Because she, she still had that bruise. Later. Yes. Radiallahu anha. And she says, and then, you know, he basically, he translates, he interprets the dream into the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as this, the moon here is basically the leader of, of Medina, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wow. So it was just a matter of time. Right, and again, I listen. So that's I get the prophecy it. right there that I was talking yes, about. Yes, yes. So in this dream, she didn't know what it was. She didn't know what this meant. So she went to her husband. He actually interpreted a dream that the moon that's resembled the prophecy of some. It's gonna. What, what's the area that they were in? Uh, high, um, the area that they were in that it was going to uh, come over this area. That that was the conquering of the area. Oh and my! That, I, I and know. then she would be. She would come. She would be marrying him. He said, what do you want with this, uh, the king of the Arabs or whatnot? Right, and then right. he ends up beating her up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so this is a prophecy being fulfilled. This yeah. is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. First hand, yeah. First then, hand, narrated from her. Yeah. He well, skipped all this conveniently. Uh, uh, conveniently. Yeah, so we yeah. can see w there's a big lesson here. You see, like you were saying, when you when you take the text out of context, you don't put it in its proper uh, uh, text. And that, again, coming from, uh, it's, it's beyond me as to why he will... See, well, I am very, I'm very disappointed because you, you listen, we can, we can differ, but we can still have some integrity, Yeah. but it's hard. It's hard to really, it's, it's hard to have a, 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 a fruitful conversation with, with someone who lacks just the basic decent, just a, a medicum of, 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 uh, integrity. Wow. Someone such as Rashid al-Hamani. So what happens after this now? So he confer they confirm that he is the messenger. They're going to go ahead and beat. He says he's, uh, he's going to be uh, an enemy of mine till the death because he's not, he's not one of us now. He's, yep. he's not uh, someone from their uh, right. descendants, right? Yep. So what happens from there? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fast forward in, <coughs> fast forward in to Ghazwat, uh, uh, Ghazwat Khaybar, yeah. right? Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam later on ends up marrying. But before that, before that, so he marries her, but before that, didn't he try to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Didn't he try to kill him? He became Huyay an enemy Ibn, of state? Did uh, we cover that? Huyay, Huyay Ibn, yeah, Huyay Ibn Akhtab, that, that was the thing though. All, all, all of them, um, the, the first tribe was Bani Qaynuqa, yeah. and then after that, Bani Nadir, and then. He's from Banu Nadir, this one. Yes. 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 But that's the thing, though. Bani Nadir, Bani Nadir, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not, by the way, he did not kill them. He did not he kill them. He exiled them. He exiled them to Khaybar. And many of them Khaybar, went. Khaybar, that's the play. Khaybar, that's yes. it. Yes. Khaybar with the Kha. 
So yes. the people, yes, Huyay ibn Khabib al nadri That's why we say Safiya ibn Huyay ibn Akhtab al nadri Yes. Right? Um, yes, they were they were taken. And, and th- that's exactly what happened. Okay, he showed mercy in this case also. He let them go. Actually, according to the cult, the time, the laws, this man, he went and tried to assassinate the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So he ended up, having mercy. he ex- exiled him. And then he went and tried to uh, try to wage a world, what we say, like a world war with all the tribes and everyone to go ahead and annihilate Islam, annihilate the Prophet Muhammad. Because that's what he's saying. He ex- executed him. At the end, then he was. They are going to keep trying, bring the Old Testament. Name one person that Jesus killed because he was an apostate. Judas, he, he, he gave him to the Jews and he never ordered his disciple. His disciples to he mentions uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, who, disclaimer, we love as one of the mightiest messengers, him and his blessed mother. There's a whole chapter named after in the Quran. I think that these are very important points that our friends out there need to know uh, that we're not the Antichrist. We love Christ and we worship like Christ. We greet like Christ. Peace be upon you. Salam alaikum. And I can go on and on. Uh, and we, we, most importantly, we have the same theology as Jesus, worshiping one and only one God. Right. Yes. Uh, we don't worship any prophets or messengers. We don't worship Jesus, but we worship the God of Jesus. And then he talks about Jesus way never waging a war. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I think the comparison uh, the comparison is, is is this is a qiyas al farq or you could even say qiyas fasid. Like the analogy that he's trying to put forward is is is, is really extremely extremely fa- uh, flawed. Uh, the reason being is that when you're trying to compare the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the small community of the Hawariyin or the companions or the disciples that Jesus upon whom be peace had, you cannot compare. You cannot compare the two because. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was the victor he was the triumphant at the end of the day Jesus along with his companions were not they were not so Jesus alayhi salatu wasallam had he been given the opportunity he would have done so that's what Dan- Absolutely. that's what Daniel was saying he didn't have jurisdiction now the, he didn't he, have the he didn't he didn't have the authority they didn't they didn't end up uh, taking um, control he didn't have government. the not even yeah. that he didn't have the power the he power, wasn't yes. able to he didn't have he didn't have the, 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 the he didn't it's not a, about being courageous or being determined he didn't have the manpower to do that mm-hmm. to revolt I mean here we're talking about Judea it's a it's a colony it's a Roman colony they're colonized literally right by the Romans, right? But but here's the thing, though. I mean, Jesus, upon whom be peace, in one of the narrations, he tells his companions to go sell their money, their 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 garments, and to go sell their purses, if you will, their sacks, and to go buy swords with them. To do what? Mm-hmm. What are you going to tell me? The sword is a metaphorical sword, and the, so and everything else becomes a metaphor, and everything becomes allegorical. No, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There were times when he set his foot down, and rightfully so. Re- remember what we were talking about earlier: that there's a time to be compassionate, there's a time to turn the other cheek, there's a time to be dismissive, there's a time to be firm. What about Jesus when he's firm in the New Testament? He says, look, th- for those who dishonor their parents, disrespect their parents, put them to death. This Jesus is talking about if you disrespect your parent, Jesus, peace be upon him, he's saying put that person to death. Yeah, that doesn't... So if, if he's saying put that for your for the parents' disrespect, imagine some of these other things like adultery, uh, heresy and all that. Like he's going to just be like uh, you know, let it go. But here another thing too. Jesus upon whom be peace when he walked up to the temple and he saw the money lenders he smashed the table. He smashed that. He got angry. Yeah, because they were doing riba. They were doing the riba right in the interest, middle of the interest, temple. Yeah. Now, now, hear, hear, hear me out. I think this is important even for Muslims watching this because we're, we're we've been conditioned so much in America between us Muslims that everything has to be done with gentleness and love and kindness and a smile and a pat on the back and you have to remember. But we have that. We have that. There, That's, we yeah. have it. There's time. a place and time gotcha. for it. Yeah. But that's not going to be effective in each and every Muslim that you're speaking to. So, for example, we don't get on the mimbar and constantly remind our Muslim brothers and sisters of Allah's mercy week in, week out, week in and week out. There are some people who are going to listen to that. The more you remind them of Allah's mercy, the more defiant and rebellious they become. You got to talk about the hellfire too. Certain Muslims, they have thick skin. Mm. You have to remind them of, of Allah's severe wrath and punish them that awaits them, that awaits them if they do not wake up, tie their boots, and they put their belt on, and yeah. they get serious. So it's a balance. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a, of it's course a it's a balance, yes. And so Jesus, upon whom be peace, 
He doesn't come to them and say, guys, didn't I tell you guys to stop this and pat one on the back and say, hey, buddy, you should know better. No. He got snapped. angry. He snapped. <laughs> he got angry. But here's the thing, too, is that today, and Muslims need to listen, need, really need to hear this, is that today when you get angry for the sake of Allah, suddenly you need to go see a therapist and your wife is taking you to some therapist because you got angry one time or you your voice was loud a little bit, right? When it's for the sake of Allah or if you're an imam at the masjid and you, you know, you're a little bit... You're passionate. You get a little bit angry. Suddenly, oh, you're pushing people away from the well, masjid. The you lack wisdom. But, of course, yes, I'm getting to that. Okay. I'm getting to that. You lack wisdom, brother. You scared people away from the masjid. This is not how you invite people to Islam and everybody becomes an expert on how to give da'wah, right? <laughs> now, here's the thing, though. When people do it for social justice causes, they're praised, they're celebrated. People are saying, we want to hear your guys' voice even more. Louder, louder. So let me get this straight. When we get angry for the sake of Allah, which is, by the way, in Islam, this is called ghadab mahmud. This is good angry. It shows your ghayrah that you have for the deen. Mm. It shows your ghayrah. We're not talking about being loud and careless here. But why is it that when people get angry for the right reasons, for the sake of Allah, suddenly it's shunned? We Muslims do this between our... We forge this culture. But now when people are out on the street, for example, and they're parading for their LGBT causes, they're parading for their transgender causes, people are yelling at the top of their lungs and everybody is celebrating that. Everybody is championing that. And they're being celebrated all around. Why is that? Mm. That's a good point. That's a that's a problem. This yeah. is a deficiency in our way of dealing with things, right? Mm -hmm. So the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, right? Um, the Sahaba when they described how the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam was, he says, "Ida khataba fina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ihmarat wajnata wa ala sautuhu wa kaanhu mundiru jaysh yaqulu sabbahakum wa masakum." It's as if he was the leader of an army, warning us of someone who is going to come, right, and harm us. Right, his his cheeks or his face would get red, and his voice would become loud. The vein would be popping out. Yes. So people have to. Muslims have to stop with this nonsense of, oh, brother. The, no, that is the prophetic way to do it. If you're passionate about something, and the community is out of line, and you get passionate, and you're worked up, that is an indicator of your iman. Now, if we're talking one on one, that's a different story. Yeah. I'm, I, I can't be hard on you if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But if you're speaking to a community and the community is losing it and we, we're, 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 we've just gone a little bit too far, then it's understand, it's expected that the imam is going to be passionate and is going to maybe you know be a little bit angry and express his frustration. There's nothing harmful in that. And we have to stop pushing this nonsense. Uh, so we got, um, I think people can start to realize when you start to unpackage a lot of this, you know, sincere people who are right. out there watching, sure. doesn't matter, Christian, uh, Jew, whoever, somebody who's a truth seeker, and they can right. see like, hold on, man, this is totally opposite what I'm getting from this machine gun method. Should we go on or we should start to... No, I, I just want to say that this is why, this is why early Christianity, uh, right? Um, I, I think it's really, I think... And Allah knows best that for Christians, if they really want to keep marketing that Jesus as the Prince of Love and the Prince of Peace, and He wouldn't hurt a fly, and if he, you hit them, then He's going to give you the other cheek. I think it it is only better for them to separate Him from the Trinity and separate Him from God, mm -hmm. because if 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 when you're trying to tell me about Jesus being this way, and then I see the commandments that He as God commanded in the Old Testament, it, it's going to be very hard to reconcile between the two. It's yeah. hard to harmonize the two. So just say he's a prophet. God did that in his own wisdom, and you can separate the two. Mm -hmm. That's, In other words, it's more coherent, I believe, as a strategy moving forward. I think most people don't even read the Bible because you can play this game that these guys do, and th then you lack integrity and you you lack truthfulness uh, like they do. But you can bring up verses. Just, I just uh, do this to strike an example where Jesus said, Of my enemies who wish that I not reign over them, bring them here and slay them in front of me. This is Jesus saying that, right? Can I? Can There's I? There's a context be, to that. Go ahead. Yeah, a lot of people will argue, and this is why I didn't bring that up, is because this is they will say that this is a parable that Jesus yeah. is speaking of another king. Yeah. But but we, because I I hope we're we're men of integrity. Yeah. Uh, we're, and we're we're we know better that we're not going to use that as a exactly. We're just gonna yeah. we're gonna meet them so, and say you said it's a parable. 
Okay. You see I, how you, you, I didn't even know you were going to say that. I know it's a parable. You know it's a parable. Right. But now you try to tell some of these things in context to some of these guys. They're not going to somehow have no integrity and be the like, they're going to keep pushing, pushing. They're like twisting. Eddie, through. the difference between them and us, they're desperate. We're not. Mm -hmm. They're desperate. They're desperate. Yeah, we're yeah. not. They want, they got to sell those books. By the, by the grace of Allah, we're not desperate. Yeah. If you want to come in and join Islam, if you want to be a Muslim, by all means, mm -hmm. right? But we're not going to lie and fabricate to bring people in. I don't think these guys, the point is, they don't, they're not even trying to have someone become a Christian or anything. These guys don't even spend any time inviting people to Christianity. What they do, they spend 100% of the time you yeah. know, shooting bullets yeah. at Islam, yeah. you know, trying to yeah. discredit Islam. I, you don't see any of these Islamophobes coming out and spending the time and talking about the pillars of their faith, right. you know, why the proof of Christianity. They don't do any of that. That's yeah. the ironic thing. I have people who just criticized Muhammad once and he ordered his disciples to go and kill him, even lying. His name is Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. He's a Jewish guy. They killed him, they lied to him, they took him and they killed him. He, he, he How does this man say this? He knows the background. Between you and I, Akhi Ali, he knows better. He knows the context. He knows the background. Do you hear that? And you're like, what? You know, you I'm, really, not, I'm taking imagine a Imagine you don't know bit. anything about Islam and you hear this from him. You'd be like, man, for real? These guys, Prophet Muhammad, for real? He's, I mean, he's, oh, pro it's, he's so, basically so. depicting Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as someone with this grandiose, you know, attitude, so full of himself. And he can't take someone criticizing him. I mean, for the love of, a, for the love of God, Prophet Muhammad والسلام, was accused of a lot of things. Right, so for Kaab ibn al Ashraf to come along and accuse him of something else is that really going? Subhanallah. Um, how how can I say? Let, let's let's do this. Kaab ibn al Ashraf. I find it really really low for someone like this to say him to come out in public on a podcast uh, such as the one he was on recently to say that Prophet Muhammad was criticized once by Kaab ibn al Ashraf. Hello, that's not what happened. Kaab ibn al-Ashraf, and again, let's provide some context. He was not someone who simply uttered the wrong word at the wrong time in the wrong place. This man was known to be a criminal with a laundry list of crimes that he mm -hmm. perpetuated. Let's, let's, let's start down that list. First off, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, when he came to Medina, he wanted to unite the Jews and the Muslims all alike under one community, not one faith, not not like interfaith dialogue today. We're all we're all the same. Hey, good, thank you. This is how we do it. No, the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, when he came to Medina, it was it was tribes, it was different this tribes. This is an historic document. Yes, that was the created, declaration. Right? It's called the Declaration of Medina. Declaration it, of Medina, like no other. I mean, this is like he's trying to bring this is the peace. Yeah. This is the king of peace. He, he's trying to make peace in the community. He didn't come. If he was really coming and he wanted to get rid of the Jews, he had the power and the will to do that. He could have easily said the first thing we got to do is we got to get rid of these Jews because we simply don't like them. Let's get rid of Benu Qainu Why did he do that? Benu he had the authority. He had the power. He could have done that. Yes. Yes, he could have. But he didn't. Because that's not who he is. His, exactly. his, his character, by default, his character is loving. His character is uh, for forgiven. His character is charitable, right? Uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, this is this is who he was by nature, right? It, it's when you get someone who's very loving and caring, uh, when you rile them up, there comes a point in time where you can push someone towards a cliff. They can take a step, two, three, four, five backwards. The next step, if they take, they're gonna fall off of the cliff. So there comes a time where you have to start pushing back. Right? So the declaration of Medina is Prophet Ali Salatu Wasallam. He comes in, he finds all these scattered tribes, four tribes, uh, three tribes of Medina, Banu Qainuqa, Banu Nadir, and also uh, uh, Banu Quraidha. The Prophet Ali Salatu Wasallam he says, This is one Ummah. Meaning here, the word Ummah, by the way, has a broader meaning. It has eight meanings in the Quran. But the word Ummah here, meaning that we are one community, that we will fend the enemy collectively. And we will all stand by side by side as a as one group, as one community. Who signed on to this pact? Banu Qainuqa, Banu Nadir, and also Banu Quraidha. All of them agreed to these terms and conditions that the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasallam stipulated. The first group, the first group, the Jewish tribe of Banu Qainuqa was the first one to renege. They were the first one to renege. Treason now. Yes. 
The Prophet ﷺ did not harm them. He allowed them to leave. He exiled them. The same thing goes with Banu Nadir. Banu Qaynuqa happened after Badr. Banu uh, An Nadir happened after Uhud, and Banu uh, uh, and uh, Banu Quraidah. Banu Quraidah happened after Ghazwat Al Khandaq, and Khaybar happened after Ghazwat Al uh, 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 Sulh Al Hudaybiyah. Mm -hmm. Now the Prophet ﷺ he let go. He completely let them go away scot free. Banu Qaynuqa and Banu Nadir. Okay. So the Prophet Ali wasalam, if he really had a problem with the Jews per se, because I know what he's getting at, and I'm surprised he didn't say it. They're literally trying to say that there was anti-Semitism going on at, it, it, during the the dawn of Islam, but liar. you can't you he's can't liar. you can't do that because Arabs are we'll give Semitic evidence. people. Yeah, he's lying again, they're, <laughs> liar. They're Semitic people. He didn't I, say I, that. I'm very, I'm very. Look, I'm, I'm very. Um, uh, I, I would think you know, you know, not. Um, just myself i'm not sure. someone to really attack people and whatnot but right. when i see someone who's fake a liar i'm going to call it out and you know even there's a lot of people who are out there who might you know be antagonistic towards islam but you could see maybe there's some you know the door is always open but when someone's just a clear fake and a liar he's this is what he is you know so yeah. i'm just calling it out um, so so let's let's so go on not so we don't lose uh drag on too much yeah here. yeah so the story of kab ibn al ashraf i mean he narrows it down as just making one silly comment and suddenly the prophet ali salatu wasalam is commanding him to be killed. No, this person was under the oath of the Muslim and he reneged. He reneged on that oath. He reneged on that pact that was between his tribe and the Muslims. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after Ghazwat Badr after we're not talking about this is not like a car deal like we made a deal for a car and we renege and whatnot. no no this is like this no. is the sanctity of life of this is the, the this the is sacred sacred you know this is the serious yeah yeah this is serious this is not a youtube share yeah. or a comment or a like on a youtube mm -hmm. no this is far beyond that right so qabin mil ashraf immediately after the, uh, the 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 polytheists or the meccans were defeated in Badr, this man qab ibn al ashraf Right, who was known to be a very wealthy merchant, by the way. He was very wealthy. He was very strong. He was very good looking. Yeah, and he was he, he had a lot going for himself, if you want to say that. Right, he goes from his tribe and he goes to Mecca. What does he do? He ends up speaking ill of the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam. He yushabib, yani, I want to say this in Arabic. Yushabibu bi nisa al Muslimin wa bi um al Fadl zawjat al Abbas radiyallahu anhu. He used to he used to perform poetry in the middle of the masses. Right, speaking ill of the wife of Al Abbas. Al Abbas is the Prophet's uncle, so he would speak about her, describing her in very intimate ways. But he would also do the same to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Those things, some scholars of the Sira say, those things could be overlooked. But the fact that he was there in Badr, supposedly this man now is supposed to be a community member of who? Of Medina. He's under an oath. He goes and he crea creates chaos. He's provoking the Meccans to start a new war with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam, he was not again. He was not. He was not a zombie. He had eyes out, so people are listening and people are carrying news back and forth because this is an Islamic state that's under threat. And every, by the way, don't don't come at me with that. Well, why do they have those? Every country has al mukhabarat They're at the verge of an extinction now. Yes. Yes. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he hears this, that's when the Prophet ﷺ commanded for this man to be put to death. Not his tribe, him. The Prophet ﷺ commanded him to be killed. Not his tribe, not his people. It's, it's, we have to separate between the two. So this is not some innocent man. One thing I think that's very important, and I think it's the topping on the cake. This man was a very well-known poetry uh, uh, at, at the caliber of another person by the name of Abu Azza al-Jumahi. Now, poets at the time of the Prophet, or during the first century of, of the Hijrah, poets during, I think, even of the Jahili period, poets were like the propaganda machines that we have today, right? The CNN, the Fox News, the CBS, this and that and the other, right? They were the ones who would caused a lot of this havoc to happen they would be the ones instigating the war they would be the ones provoking the war and by the way it's funny because there, there's a book it's called uh the shaping of the arabs that was written by joel uh carmichael who speaks about this when she talks about the poets right she says that they were literally the ones who were adding fuel to the fire so this person was not just an average person see what i don't like is that the way he depicts this is that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sitting with with his companions and saying, 
Who should we get rid of today? Who do you guys think of? Uh, let's get rid of Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. Excuse me, that's not how this happened. And I think people have, to, and I think, alhamdulillah, a lot of people, including non-Muslims, are starting to see, alhamdulillah, by this great work that you yourself, you're doing with a lot of these rebuttals and Muslims have at least a final chance to answer and rebut a lot of this nonsense. People are kind of starting to see how much of a, uh, a snake these these characters are, are actually, uh, are in fact are. Yeah. And if you were to take, not 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100 generals, uh, some of the most famous influential leaders of their time, uh, people who have the movers and shakers and whatnot, and you would ask them, okay, how would you have dealt with the situation? They wouldn't have dealt with it any way better than the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, you look at, you know, uh, people who are sitting, you know, at their keyboard and whatnot and just looking to, to, to foster and promote hate and whatnot. They try to use these things. But when, when you put it in context and you see, like, okay, this person committed treason, you had the other person, the Sophia, the father of Sophia, he actually tried to assassinate Prophet Muhammad. They tried to kill him. Imagine someone tried to kill now the president of the United States and whatnot. Where's he going to be? What's yeah. going to happen to him? We yeah. understand that. Right. In this con but imagine at that time, even at that time, what were the, the laws, the regulations, the code? Uh, this the is code. all normative. This, this is, is norm all normative no, protocol. This nor That's a, a very important point. Normative protocol that's happening at that time. Standard. It's nothing new. I mean, and, it, and it's according to the book, the laws, the Torah. It's according to this. That's yeah. It. If you look at it, yeah. it's right there. Yeah, it's treason. It's in the Old Testament. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... So there's not much to um, even say more on that. It's just very hypocritical. You know, it reminds me... Um, I want to uh, quote uh, Thomas Carlyle. He said, The lies, Western slander, which well meaning zeal has heaped around this man, Muhammad, so some are disgraceful to ourselves only. This is a very profound quote by Thomas Carlyle. Uh, and when people really look into Prophet Muhammad's life, they should, because Michael H. Hart has him as one of the most, inf the number one, he puts Prophet Muhammad number one as the most influential man in history. And it, it, what came to mind is the other side. When God Almighty Allah talks about, uh, that we, I have not sent Prophet Muhammad except rahmatan lil alameen as a mercy to all mankind. And you had Jews at that time. This is a Jew, but what about the other Jews who are people who are looking at his life? Uh, Abdul Salam is his name. Right. He was a scholar, right. mm -hmm. the best of the learned men, academics of that time. He accepted Islam. Why did he do that? If he was like, you know, he was someone who was sincere, he was searching, he accepted Islam. Didn't you have a Jew also, another, was it a Jew, who came and put a loan towards, he gave Prophet Muhammad a loan, and then he was like, okay, let me test him. He fits all the signs, but let me test the forbearance sign, because it was in there that he was forbearant. He had to be, for, you know, if right. someone knows what forbearance is, sure. that's when you're in a position of authority now that you can punish, but you forgive and go beyond. So this man gave the loan to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. You know the story? And then he ends up uh, coming back uh, beforehand and says, give me the money. You're cheap. What's going on? You know, you don't pay back, whatnot. And then Omar steps up yeah. and he's about to take care of business. And Prophet, Prophet Muhammad says, step back, you know, uh, give him in the, the money. In the lisahib al haqq maqala. Yeah. No, he just says that the person, in the lisahib al haqq the person who has, you know, rights, uh, had that have to be handed over to them, they have something to say. In other words, his his grief is understood. Was this a Jew man? And, was this a person who was a Jew? If also? we're talking about the same story, he gave it to them, and then he said, "Wazidhu ya Umar." He said, "Give him what he what he needs. Give, pay him his debt back and, and increase more. him and give him <laughs> oh, more." Wow! Yeah. And yeah. then and then Omar radiallahu. He said, "Why did you do that?" He talked to him. He said, "I wanted. I was testing him. I wanted to see." And he did. He fit yeah. the description yeah. of being the prophet of yeah. God. Yeah. Salah, salah. Look, these are the story. This is what we have. Right. Why are you missing out all this? What, what about the? We can go on and on. I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away. But what was it? Was the man who also tugged on the prophet Muhammad so much that he left a scar? Um, yes, is, yes. Is this the same story or is this another one? I think it's the same story. The but same I might, story. So yeah. this is added in there. He, right. So you got, in this in this particular case, you have a Jewish scholar accepts Islam. You have this Jewish man also later accepts Islam. You had the uh, Christian, uh, they say, Waraka ibn Nofal, these were the most learned men. My point here is when someone is sincere and they're looking at Prophet Muhammad's life from a sincere lens, generally wanting to know the truth, they don't walk away with like these guys walking away because they're not sincere. They're they're just hate provocateurs, and they're causing. And it's not in their interest. It's, it's not, not in, their, in inter their interest to, and and that's the thing. It's not in their interest to portray Islam through any positive lens. Mm -hmm. 
it's just not in their interest. No, and you have a uh, again because we talk about Jewish and like he said, you know, he makes it seem like you know Islam Muslims hate Jews and da 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 and this and that. Islam saved the jury. If you look at professor who wrote the JC essay, Jewish professor David War Warrenstein. He's an academic professor of Jewish studies. This is in the Jewish Chronicles. His quote, Islam saved the jury, meaning the Jewish people. When they were persecuted by Christians and others, they were just, uh, you know, ran out of town, next out. Islam saved the Jewish people. It takes discipline and maturity to praise those you don't like. And this is something I, I believe both of these individuals on that platform lack. You are judging a war that happened 3,000 years ago by the standards of today. The difference between the Old Testament and Islam, we believe those applied for those circumstances and stayed there. These should not be applied today. Islam, jihad, should be applied in the time of Muhammad, today and forever. So killing the kids of polytheists, Muhammad answered, they are from them. They are just polytheists like them. So it's okay to kill them. And let me tell you about killing Killing kids, how you define a kid in the raid of Bani Quraida. Yeah, so Allah Mustahad again this this uh, I think this is the last one we'll wrap it up. I, I think one of the I think this he has a track record for being very guile, uh conniving and, and and not a trustworthy individual, honestly. Because again, he, he spews this out like a like a like a machine gun, but doesn't give you the context. He said he doesn't tell you why it happened. It's again he 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 depicts a false narrative that the Prophet Ali Salatu was just sitting along with his companions and they thought, you know what, let's go let's go annihilate Bani Quraida. Th that's how he's making things look, right? So the, again, the, the context is that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um some ulama of the Sira would argue the most difficult period the most difficult ghazwa, the, the, the scariest uh, of all battles was ghazwa al-Khandaq. Because ghazwa al-Khandaq was basically, it happened, took place uh, during the fifth year of, of the uh, the hijrah. Ghazwa al-Khandaq, the trench, the battle of the trench. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, this was a time where the Arab tribes, Mecca, along with other tribes, along with Bani Quraida, right? Bani Quraida was a tribe that colluded, that was under oath, Right, they had a pact. The Muslims had a pact with Bani Quraida, right, that they would protect Medina. They are a constitu a constituent of this Medina, of this town. That what happened later is they ended up going behind the back of the Muslims. They ended up colluding with the Meccans, with the polytheists, along with others, right? Other conf they call it the Confederates, totaling I think up to ten thousand soldiers together. Right, this was a very, very even the Sahaba radiAllahu anhum would say that it was a very, very difficult time for uh, uh, the Muslims. So the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam after the battle, and by the way, nothing happened in the battle. It was Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in Surah Al-Hazab where He says, "Wakaf Allahu al-Mu'minin al-Qital." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He sent a whirlwind. He sent you know other things that happened where the Muslims did not fight, did not end up fighting against the not the, the the disbelievers. Word got back to the Prophet Ali Salatu wa Salam, finding out that Bani Quraida was in fact colluding and was treacherous, treacherous and colluding with the Meccans in fighting against the Muslims, fighting against who their own community. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously, they're held accountable for what? Treason, right? Now, the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, he's not the one. I think people have to remember this very important part here. The Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam was not the one who instituted. He was not the one who called out the verdict. They wanted Saad ibn Mu'adh to be the one calling out the verdict, because Saad ibn Mu'adh in the Jahiliyyah times, Banu Quraida were allies with. Uh, uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, the Aus, the, the, the tribe of Aus. So they thought that Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was going to rule in favor of this treachery, let them go, have them pay a ransom or something. But he ended up saying that those combatants, again, let us focus here, the combatants, those, the elderly, were the ones to be put to death, not the women and not the children. Now, one has to differentiate, though. At that time, there was no such thing as civilian and combatant. 
There was no such thing as you're a civilian, you're in the army, you're a combatant, right? There was no such separation at that time. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu commanded for all of them to be killed. And to be honest here, uh, some ulama of the seerah say that some of the people uh, put the number at 60 all the way up to 900. There's a long, a long discussion, uh, and the numbers vary from the, one scholar to the other in terms of how many men were actually killed. That's what I was going to ask you next. Yeah. I heard that the sources for this is a um, it, the numbers. One scholar was talking about how uh, maybe you can elaborate on this. That sure. it was um, a Jewish reference who's narrating the amount of people who were there, and that they exaggerated this number. That and you mentioned sixty. Yeah, some people they put it up to st- but 600, even this is, this 500. Is quite, this but for us, for us, it's it's to a point that's irrelevant because the, the, the point, the lesson here yeah. is that these people, the Prophet ﷺ, please, the Prophet ﷺ was not running around indiscriminately yeah. killing random people. If he was truly doing that, no one would side with him. His loyal companions would not live and die for him. If he was out randomly, indiscriminately killing any random person who comes in front of him. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to remember is that the Prophet ﷺ was not the one who instituted or carried out the verdict. It was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Now the most interesting part of this whole story... And it was was ruled according to the Torah. To their own Torah. Torah, Torah, But the, 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 the topping on the cake again is that neither one of them said, Oh, this is oppression. This is injustice. Do you know why? Because they knew deep inside what was waiting for them. Uh So I'm not sure why he's defending those who actually admit and acknowledge their own wrongdoing. Neither one of them said, you know what, this is not right. Because they know. Yeah. They know what's what's waiting for them. And then uh, it's interesting, he, he mentioned, and this is for the video before, Jesus. But if you look at in one shot, Moses, who we love and revere, is uh, one of the five great messengers. When right. he came back, it's in the Bible, and he saw the people worshiping the calf. In one shot, how many? 3,000 were killed? Allah alam, but yeah. That, they say around 3,000, according to their, this, their sources. But sure. how many people actually died during the lifespan of Prophet Muhammad in the wars and everything? Some say estimate about 1,400. Yeah, it's, 1200, it's, it's, 13, it's a, 14. But what's more important than that? 3,000 in one shot. So how if you're gonna if you're gonna discredit Prophet Muhammad? What about you know it goes back to the to Moses and you know the wars that uh, but, but the things here, that he was a part of? Why I, I think I think each and every Muslim, yeah, each and every Muslim should take it upon him or herself. And I think this is really I, I'd call even non-Muslims for this as well. Is that when you look at a battle, mm-hmm. when, when you look at two people fighting, are you going to immediately assume that they're both? transgressors and both need to be pushed uh, uh, in prison and both of them need to be you know uh, uh, executed or both of them need to be incarcerated there's there's someone who was wrong and there's someone who was right usually right you don't just look at two and say oh those are two evil people because you're engaged in aggressive action it doesn't necessarily mean that you're an evil person and as i mentioned earlier brother eddie i think we're having this discussion is that if you have a judge who sentences someone to life in prison or even for someone for the death executes uh, someone to be executed or someone to be put on the death the deathbed or on the electrical chair that same judge will leave that courtroom go back to his home get in his car have breakfast with his family the following day have supper with his family that that same night he'll go to the grocery store now when someone carries this out and instructs for this person to be incarcerated or to be put on the on the deathbed does that necessarily make this judge a bloodthirsty monster no it's simply the act of justice that's being carried out justice Mm -hmm. is being served right Mm -hmm. so people i'm not sure why a lot of people have a hard time separating the two that okay yes god is loving god is merciful but we all do realize that there's still a hell out there blazing mm. and it it's going to undoubtedly have inhabitants so just because there's a hell does that mean that a loving god can exist no those who will be in hell will be there justly mm. and those who will be in heaven will be there out of god's love benevolence compassion and mercy i ask allah that we are of its inhabitants uh, i mean i mean as uh, we conclude here instructions by prophet muhammad to his army before engaging in 
in battle. This is before any Geneva uh, Convention or Just War Theory or any of that. Do not kill any child, any woman, or any elderly folk or sick. This is, is this correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do not practice treachery or mutilation. Uh, do not uproot or burn palms or cut down fruit trees. Do not slaughter or animal except for food. Do not kill the monks, minister, minister, monasteries, and not kill those sitting in places of worship. Do not destroy the villages, towns, and not spoil the cultivated uh, fields, gardens, slaughter the cattle. I mean, this is unheard of, man. Imagine at that time, like yeah. lawlessness. You know, this is like worse than a wild, wild west at that time. Yeah. And he's coming, the problem himself is coming with this? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. This is like, I mean, just have you think, come on, how many books have you read? Read the Quran yeah. and look at Prophet Muhammad's life. And when you look at one of my guests, he was trying to ban Islam. Uh, Joram, I hate chopping up people's names, but he was a, fr he was, uh, a Joram Van Dam. Uh, you sound familiar? No, not at all. Very nice brother. And he was about to write a book. He wrote a book, Apostate, and he was going to write a book before that uh, about Islam. He's in Norway. He was, uh, he was looking at the life of Prophet Muhammad. He was looking at the Quran, his Sirah, and he was comparing. He's a Christian. He's looking at also the Old Testament. He's looking at the the Bible, and he's looking at Moses, and he's comparing the two, and he's being sincere. That's the difference between them and this guy. And he was a, he was an Islamophobe. He he didn't like Muslims. He was trying to ban Islam in Norway, and then he concludes. He's telling the story. He concludes that. Hold on, he's being. Uh, truthful he's like no this doesn't make sense actually mm -hmm. if I gotta be sense there's more violence here coming from this right. direction yeah. from the Bible yeah. he ends up accepting Islam yeah. he ends up accepting Islam it's amazing yeah. and now he's calling people to Islam submission to the creator not the creation can I can I make one more point yes because I, I think it, it, it might have been a little bit difficult for people to grasp at, at uh, earlier when we're talking about God's attributes we're yes. talking about God's uh, who God is God his attributes he's a loving merciful god that's who he is okay god doesn't become he doesn't become loving he doesn't become merciful that's a part of who, that's who he is right so people have to acknowledge that if a again i said this earlier but i just want to reiterate it because it, it, it might have flown over the heads of certain people is that if a loving god can reveal those 600 odd commandments in the old testament and some of them are harsh, some of them are difficult to grasp, and so on and so forth. What prevents a loving God from reintroducing the very same laws later on in time? Mm -hmm. Meaning that if you're going to look at us Muslims and say your God can't be a loving God because of the stoning, because of the, uh, the, the adulterer, because of you know ABC, XYZ, the same thing can be said about you. That God of the Old Testament, that was a loving God, right? So a loving God can reveal harsh commandments, correct? Yes. So that same loving God is revealing, right, at the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, certain harsh laws. So it's, it's not mutually exclusive. One does not negate the other. Mm -hmm. And if you if you look at it, m many of these are deterrents. I mean, the scholars talk about you know it's very very difficult to enforce a lot of these things, that, but they act as a, a huge deterrent to keep the criminals in check. That's why you can go to Dubai, you can go to places, you know, that are Muslim majority who who are not implementing everything 100 percent. But what they are, they'll see that. I remember uh, Bilal Phillips, uh, Sheikh Bilal Phillips. He talks about when he was uh, when the Gulf War was happening, and they had like three thousand. They had a Dawa center. And the troops, American troops would go there. They had like over 3,000 except Islam. And their stories were like, man, we'd come here. They'd see everything just left in the open, lunchtime, you know, nighttime. You know, you don't have like 100 locks, security systems. Right. It's like, yeah. that's what it is, you know. When yeah. people are, criminals are in check, that's when you have peace in society, right? Otherwise, the criminals are let loose. You, you're, you're being terrorized by them, right? It, you need you need law and order, right? And th this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, too, is that people for People are starting to see that with all the looting happening in California, this then and they're giving you know what you know a thousand dollars you know people can go ahead and steal and then and now people are getting fed up they're like but you know seeing what's happening when you start uh, not having you know this um, firm laws firm laws you yeah. have to sometimes you have to yes and they're uh, respecting Islam for that a lot of people now when they're looking they're saying Islam is the last hope I'm even considering it now because well, that's the thing. That's the. Th I think that's what I wanted to. That's yeah. what we started off with earlier. Is that there are a lot of people out there who are looking and considering Islam, not because it's like every other faith or religion out there. No, 
To the contrary, they're accepting Islam and they're considering Islam because of people who are out there who are spreading the undiluted truth. So when you as a Muslim, you're looking at another Muslim and criticizing him thinking that, oh, he's the worst thing that happened to Dawah. Do you not realize how many people are considering Islam because of the very person that you have a problem with? Different strokes for different folks, mm -hmm. right? There's a niche for the raw message of Islam. There are people who like that raw message. There are other people who like that, you know, interfaith dialogue in the soft, you know, oh, Islam is about love and peace and mercy and we just have to get along and it's about tolerance and accepting one another and embracing one another. Thank you. There's a place and time for that. But when we're talking about deterrent, deterrence and uh, uh, incentive, some people work and they're moved by an incentive. Mm -hmm. Other people, the only thing that will get them to move stop cease and desist is by having a deterrent in place yeah and this is what this is why islam is such a relevant religion because it speaks to human psychology it speaks to the human nature and it speaks above all to our reality yes and it's built on something that makes the most sense of worshiping one and only one god not his creation and being yeah. morally upright uh i'm getting nervous now because uh it's about i gotta we gotta pray yeah and we've covered so much and uh uh, I would just want to end with this. I think it's very important how how dangerous these guys and even for them, there's hope if they turn their life around. Of course, and they stop you know this treachery. Of course, people like this who you know made a career out of this. And I really felt like when I after because I was there you know at the uh, with Pat, and I want to commend Patrick and David you know for putting this together. May Allah guide him. May Allah um, guide him. I mean, I mean, he's, I mean. he's like a yeah. very nice man, and we had a good you know conversation. He is. And, he's, he is. Yeah. and um. When I was leaving, you had this uh, Rob, I don't know why they call him Bobby, he was there by himself. And I was just trying to give him some doubt, trying to give him some advice, you know what I mean, to right. be sincere. And it was very quick. And what I sensed was he just seemed like a very lonely person, just, just know. you know, somebody who just, you know, he needed friends. He needed, so he just, just, just by himself, you know, sure. and you're not going to live a good life, peaceful life. I told him, look, I said, look, my advice for you really is to be sincere with yourself. Be sincere with your creator and ask your creator for guidance. I left him with that. And even for someone like that, is there hope for them if they change their way and they turn and they repent it to the creator of the heavens and earth that they can go ahead and... There's a, ho there's a hope for everyone. I uh. mean, yes, indeed, indeed. There, I mean, this might even sound foolish. There's hope for Robert Spencer. There's, That's who I was referring to. There's, That's who I had the little... Uh, I mean, if you look at some, I mean, if you look at the life of those who went before the Sahaba, the, you, could, you look at consider the past of even Malcolm X. It was not a bright, mm -hmm. you know, on the track path. But hey, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guides whom He wills. Because what they're doing is dangerous. It's dangerous for people who are credulous. You know, come out there naive and they look at their work and then they get in the Andrew Brevik's of the world. They yes. go and they recommend him and his manifesto and they push this, you know, fear. They create this fear and anxiety. And then you hate Muslims right. and then it leads to violence or the, even the Muslim. And you give your, you know, your Daesh interpretation, your, you know, uh, twisted interpretation, like someone who give their KKK interpretation. And now the Muslim out there, he's, you know, he's also not well grounded, but he maybe he gets his information, his hadith or his ayahs from this Rabi or this Babi or whoever. And he does something, he gets uh, infected with this extreme radical uh, behavior because he programmed him like this. It's happened. It's, yeah. It's happened. Yeah. 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 Um, how can people connect with you and learn more? Um, they can look me up on, on social media or on YouTube, Tabsira Project, uh, T-A-B-S-I-R-A, and then the word project, or Yusuf Susi, Y-O-U-S-S-E-F, and then uh, Susi, it's not Sushi, by the way, yeah. <laughs> Susi, S-O-U-S-S-I. Uh, thank you very much. Jazakallah Haid. Thank you very alaykum. much, and I want to thank you guys for tuning in, and what most people who I speak to, so who have spoken to, who took it upon themselves to really want to investigate. They've opened up the Quran for themselves. They studied the Prophet Muhammad's life for themselves and they connected with Muslims. And I'm going to give you a gift free. Go to the dshow.com and we'll send you out for free a copy of the translation of the Quran, my gift to you. And you can look for yourself. Put these verses that they bring up in context. Look at Prophet Muhammad's life in context. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already so you can benefit from future upcoming programs. Hit that notification bell. Until next time, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. When they were stabbed by a man who targeted them because they were Muslim.
Islamophobia is gaining ground. And with your support, we can push back. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. This is your brother Eddie from The Dean Show. And Islamophobia is real and it's hurting our community. Innocent lives are gone. And most people are unfamiliar with Islam's true teachings. This guy right here, this guy's trying to build a Dawah center in our country. I'm not talking to you right now, you're a solo. We're trying to build a Dawah center here. With the grace of God Almighty, Allah, the Creator, and you by our side, we can help change that. At the Dean Center, we are spreading and sharing the message of Islam, submission to the Creator, not the creation, combating Islamophobia, building community, and expanding our media reach. Don't just watch from the sidelines, be a part of the change. Click the link below, donate right now. May God Almighty Allah reward all of you.